the progress that we had uh, yesterday. Hopefully we can do the same today. Just a uh, um, couple of announcement. Uh, first announcement will uh, everyone uh, of the attendees will receive evaluation form. So he need to evaluate our course. This is our uh, first uh, University of Kentucky, uh, Mansoura University CME course. We are planning to do course every two months. So we need to learn, we need to improve our performance. We need your evaluation. Please feel free to evaluate our course, our speakers, our sessions, and let us know how to improve our performance for the next meetings, please. So uh, everyone, especially if you want to get a certificate, a, you know, a course um, attendance certificate, you need to finish the evaluation form first. So please do this, email it to, uh, you know, Mahmoud Sobh or submit it um, uh, over this weekend so you can receive the certificate. Second announcement, um, inshallah, we'll have the second course. Uh, it will be focused on gromeonephritis, so it will be GN course, and this will be on March 31st, which will be Thursday, and April 1st, which will be Friday at the same time, 4 to 6.30, Thursday and Friday, March 31st and April 1st. Without further ado, we have uh, a very fantastic and outstanding speakers today. Dr. Ahmed Abdul Wahab will talk about CKD MBD management. Then we will have an interesting case presentation from Dr. Nihal Atef. Then uh, Dr. Mohammed Bamdouh uh, will give us a lecture on management of osteoporosis in CKD patients. Then we will have um, uh, unusual case uh, presentation from Khilwan University by Dr. Kariman Mahmoud. And um, the last session will have a discussion as we have done yesterday, meet with the expert, then we'll uh, uh, summarize and conclude our meeting with take home message. And I will let Dr. Uh, Ahmed Abdul Wahab to share his slide and to start his presentation. Please, Ahmed. الرحمن الرحيم شكرا على الدعوة الكريمة وبرزنتيشن شكرا دكتور عمر مصطفى محمد ومحمود والدكتور نهال أرجو من إنه إن شاء الله ربنا يتقبل هذا العمل خالص لوجه الله وإنه زملائنا المشاركين معنا يعني يستفيدوا إن شاء الله من الحاجات ونتقبل أي اقتراحات منهم إن شاء الله لتطوير ال المعلومة اللي بتقدم ليهم إن شاء الله إن شاء الله هنتكلم على على موضوع من المواضيع اللي ليها أهمية كبيرة جدا للبراكسينج نفتولوجيس في سواء للعينين السكي دي أو اللي أنضايلسيز الموضوع بتاعنا اللي هو السكي دي مينيرال بون فاسكولار ديزيز دايما الكلمة بتاعت بونز وفي جلاس عند هارتس وفي ستون دي مهمة جدا لأنه الحقيقة أنه العينين بتوعنا أنضايلسيز أو إيفن وذاو دايلسيز البون بتاعهم بيتحول في مرحلة من المراحل أنه يبقى سويك وفراجايل جدا والهارتس بتاعتهم أو الفاسكولار سيستم بيتحول إلى العكس إلى نقيد تماما وبيصل إلى مرحلة السفير كالسفيكيشن اللي بنشوفها في معظم العينين بتوعنا أم بالس أولا لو كلنا عارفين أنه كل ما البريفلنس بتاع السيكي دي بيزيد وكل ما الجي فار بيل كل ما البريفلنس of hypocalcemia in, in, in greenish والهايبر فوسفاتيميا والهايبر باراثيروديزم بيزيد معهم كمان بيقل الليفل بتاع الفيتامين دي ال125 هاي فيتامين دي وال25 فيتامين دي توجذر مع الديكلاينمنت اوف ذا جي اف ار اند ذا انكريز ان ليفل اوف بي تي اتش الحقيقه ايه هو الديفينيشن اوف سيك دي ام بي دي هو ده سيستميك ديس اوردر اتس نوت ا لوكاليزد ديزيز جاست تو ذا بون ذا سيستميك ديس اوردر بيافكت موست اوف ذا بارتس اوف ذا بودي السيستميك ديس اوردر ده له كرايتيريا، الكرايتيريا دي بتتمثل في كيميكال ابنورماليتيز في الكالسيوم والفوسفورس والبي تي اتش والفيتامين دي ميتابوليزم 
مشاكل بتحصل في البون تورن اوفر مينراليزيشن فوليوم والجروث والسترينث كمان فاسكولار اند سوفت تيشو كالسيفيكيشن بتافكت الانديفيدوالز سفرنج فروم ذيس ديس اوردر اول ذا تيرم اللي هو رينا الاوسيو ديستروفي ده بيدسكرايب جاست الباثولوجيكال بوني تشينجز اللي بتحصل في ذيس ديزيز يعني هو بيدسكرايب اونلي وان اليمنت من السبيكترم اوف ذا ديزيز الكلاسيفيكيشن اللي محطوط واللي يهمنا كلنا ان احنا نتذكره دوما اللي هو التي ام في كلاسيفيكيشن التي ام في كلاسيفيكيشن بيقسم البول اكوردنج للديس اوردرز اكوردنج تو ذا تيرن اوفر تو ذا مينراليزيشن اند تو ذا بون فوليوم ويهمني قوي الكلاسيفيكيشن ده على الرغم من ان هو مينلي باثولوجيكال كلاسيفيكيشن هو كمان الا انه مهم علشان الكوره من الاخضر ده اللي هو الادايناميك بون ديزيز الادايناميك بون ديزيز بقى سبيكترم كبير في الـ في الانسيدنس او في حدوثه في العيانين السيك دي وسبيشالي ذوز جوينج تو دايليسيز ويمكن الشريحه دي بتقول انه الانسيدنس بتاع الادايناميك بون ديزيز از انكريزنج وسبب الانكريز بتاع الادايناميك بون ديزيز ان موست اوف ذا كيسز از هيدروجينيك لانه التريتمنت العيانين السيك دي بيتعالجوا بنان نفرولوجيست في البدايه والتريتمنت بيبتدي فيري ايرلي بكالسيوم وفيتامين دي وده بيافكت على الليفل بتاع البي تي اتش بيعملوا سبريشن وبيافكت على البون فبندخل العيان او بيوصل للاند ستيج ديزيز سيك دي 5 او ان دايليسيز وبيكون العيان دخل في الادايناميك بون ديزيز وده اتس نوت جود يعني ده معناه ان احنا عملنا سبريشن للبون تماما يعني. نبتدي الحكايه بتاعتنا منين؟ نبتدي من المينراليزيشن او مشكله المينرال ديس اوردرز اللي بتحصل الكونسبت القديم انه كان المشكله زياده البي تي اتش وزياده السيرم فوسفورس ونقص الفيتامين دي وما يصاحبها من الهايبوكالسيميا اللي بيحصل نتيجه الكرونيك كيدني ديزيز. الكونسبت الجديد لا بقى في اذر بلايرز بقى في ناس ثانيه بتشارك في الموضوع زي الكلوث وزي الفيتامين دي ريسبتورز وزي الفايبروبلاست جروس فاكتور في في كذا فاكتور دلوقتي دخلوا في الباثوفيسيولوجي بتاع ذيس ديس اوردر لكن ايفينشوالي بيؤدي في الاخر الى نقص الفيتامين دي والهايبر فوسفاتيميا اند هايبوكالسيميا ويتش ليدز تو سكندري هايبر بارا ثايروديزم اند ايفينشوالي انتو تيرشري هايبر بارا ثايروديزم هل السيركاديون ريزم له رول في الباثوفيسيولوجي بتاع السيكي دي ام بي دي؟ الحقيقه انه زي ما السيركاديون ريزم له رول في في حاجات كتيره في الهرمونز وفي وفي البروتينوريا وفي البروجريشن بتاع السيكي دي السيركاديون ريزم له رول له رول مهم جدا في البروجريشن بتاع السيكي دي ام بي دي انه نتيجه اليوريميك توكسنز بيحصل ديس اوردر في السابكازماتيك نوكليوس اللي موجوده في البرون ستيم وده بيعمل ديس اوردرز في الباراثيرويد جلاند في الفاسكولار سيستم في البون في الكيدني الميدياتورز هم الفوسفورس والاكتيفين A والفايبروبلاست جروس فاكتور 13 اند بي تي اتش. السلايدز دي بتورينا انه انه مع العيانين اللي بيخشوا في السكه دي السيركاديان ريزم بتاع البي تي اتش وبتاع الاف جي اف بيحصل له لص وده في النورمال وده في العيانين السكه دي وكمان مع اللص دي بيحصل اليفيشن للليفلز يعني لو خدنا بالنا من الليفل بتاع البي تي اتش هنا هنلاقيه وصل لخمس ارقام عاليه جدا زاد في العيانين السكه دي also the FGF في الارقام هننزل من 800 هنوصل ل 3000 يبقى اذا في في ابنورماليتيز في السيركاديون ريزم بتاع ذيس هرمونز وده بيساعد في البروجريشن بتاع السكي دي. الجزء الثاني اللي هو الفاسكولار سيستم نتيجه الابنورماليتيز اللي بتحصل في الفوسفورس وما يصاحبها من زياده البي تي اتش محاوله للكوركشن اوف هايبوكالسيميا which leads to tertiary hyperparathyroidism الابنورماليتيز دي بتعمل بون فراجيليتي البون في موديلنج بيحصل له تشينجز المينراليزيشن بيحصل لها تشينج وبتكون النتيجه زي ما استاذنا الدكتور عمرو اوضح امبارح يزيد كواليتي والكوانتيتي الحقيقه انه البوث ديس اوردرز بيحصل لهم او بيحصلوا ديس اوردرز في الكوانتيتي وديس اوردرز في الكواليتي ديس اوردرز في الفوليوم ديس اوردرز في السترينث فبتكون النتيجه البون فراجيليتي بتزيد ولذلك بيزيد الفراكشرز عندنا بلايرز كتيره جدا بيمنعوا الكالسيفيكيشنز اللي هي الكالسيفيكيشن انهبيتورز اللي يهمنا فيهم في البراكتس اللي احنا بنتعامل مع المغنيسيوم البي تي اتش احنا بنتعامل مع الحاجات دي يهمنا الليفل بتاع الكالسيوم يهمنا الليفل بتاع الفوسفورس يهمنا الليفل بتاع الفيتامين دي يهمنا الورفرين الحاجات دي احنا وي كان موديفاي لانه دي في ايدينا يعني بنقدر نعمل لها ميجرمنت ونقدر نتعامل معاها سواء بالتريتمنت او بالدايلس 
دي دي ترايل او ستادي اتعملت عندنا في 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 وحده الكلى في جامعه المنصوره يعني اشرف ان انا كنت احد افراد الفريق المشارك فيها على احد الهرمونز او احد الموليكيولز اللي بتافكت الكالسيفيكيشن اللي هو الديكو بروتين بيافكت حاجه اسمها الوينت انتجين سيستم وكانت الدراسه قالت انه مع نقص الديكو بروتين الفاسكولار كالسيفيكيشن بيزيد وسواء كان مايترال فاسكولار كالسيفيكيشن او الاورتيك فاسكولار كالسيفيكيشن. الريسك فاكتورز للاوكرنس بتاع الكالسيفيكيشن الريسك فاكتورز دي منها تراديشنال ريسك فاكتورز اللي هم الهايبر تنشن والديابيتس والسموكينج والجينيتكس والايج والديسليبيديميا دي الكومن تراديشنال ريسك فاكتورز فور كالسيفيكيشن ان اني بيشنت لكن العيان اليوريميا ده عيان سبيشال عنده حاجه يوريميك ريليتد زي التايم اوف داليسيس العيان لازم ننشور اشور على البيشنتس ان هم يستيك للفور اورز ويستيك ثلاثه تايمز بير ويك فيري امبورتنت ان انا انبه على العيان ده لان ده بيساوي جود ريموفال اوف فوسفورس واذر توكسنز اوف كورس الهايبر فوسفاتيميا الهايبر باراثيروديزم الدوزج اوف فيتامين دي الايرلي دوزنج اوف فيتامين دي اللي احنا للاسف شديد بيتكتب البيشنتس بتاعنا البروتين انرجي ويستنج والبور نيوتريشن اللي بيعاني منهم العيانين الهايبر هوموسيستينيميا والكرونيك انفلاماتوري ستيتس اللي بتحصل في العيانين بتوعنا سواء السيكي دي بيشنتس او العيانين لما كمان بيخشوا على الدايلسيس الدايلسيس بيزود الانفلاميشن فبيبقى عنده تو ريسك فاكتورز او تو كوزس اوف انفلاميشن السيكي دي اتسلف والدايلسيس اتسلف الدايلسيس بيزوده لان العيان بيتعرض لفلتر وبيتعرض للاينز بيتعرض لفيروجنز بيتعرض لسايتوكاينز بتجي له نتيجه الاوبريشن بتاعت الدايلسيس اتسلف هل السيكي دي بيدي له افكت على الموربيديتي والمورتاليتي طبعا بنشوفه في في الكلينيكال باترنز بتاعته سواء بول بينز الماسل بينز الديفورمتيز الرابشر تندونز اللي بتحصل لعيانين كتيره السودو جاوت الكالسيفيك بيري ارترايتس والفاسكولار كالسيفيكيشنز وما يصاحبها من كارديو فاسكولار ديزيزز الكالسيفيلاكسس البرورايتس التندون رابشر الفراكشرز حاجات كتيره قوي باترنز كتيره كلها بتؤثر على الكواليتي اوف لايف اوف اور بيشنتس الانسدنس بتاع الفراكشرز بيزيد في في الفيميلز عن الميلز بيزيد باي ايج وكمان بيزيد بعد الدايلسيس يعني الدايلسيس زي ما قلت من شويه بياد ريسك على البيشنت في ريجاردنج الفراكشر ريسك دي النون دايلسيس بوبيوليشن ودي الدايلسيس بوبيوليشن هنلاقي انه الريسك اوف فراكشر بينكريز بعد الدايلسيس لانه الدايلسيس زي ما قلنا من شويه بيزود الكرونيك انفلاميشن في في ستاديز كتيره اتعملت علشان تقول لنا ايه ايه الاخطر الديس اوردر الاسوء في الكالسيوم والفوسفورس والبي تي اتش هنلاحظ انه الهايبر كالسيميا الهايبر فوسفاتيميا واوف كورس الهايبر باراثيروديزم كان ليها باد افكت على العيانين بتوعنا عشان كده دايما اجين بنؤكد لابد من تايت كنترول للفوسفورس وللكالسيوم وللبي تي اتش في البيشنتس اون دايلسيس اور سيك دي بيفور دايلسيس. هاو تو ديل مع الدايليما اللي قدامنا دي زي ما قلنا في الشريحه السابقه احنا عندنا ثلاث حاجات اساسيه عندنا كالسيوم وعندنا فوسفورس وعندنا بي تي اتش وعندنا فيتامين دي وعندنا كالسيفيكيشن فاسكولار كالسيفيكيشن وعندنا مشاكل في البون. في اسسمنت ان انا ادايجنوز سواء ايكو عشان اشوف الفاسكولار كالسيفيكيشن فالفولار كالسيفيكيشن لاترال ابدومنال اكس راي عشان اشوف الاورتا والكالسيفيكيشنز سيتو شيست والابدومين للديكسا سكاننج علشان اشوف وان انتيتي اللي هي البون مينرال دينستي او تو دايجنوز الاوسيوبروزس الفلكس سكورنج علشان اشوف اللايبيلتي او الانسدنس ريسك اوف فراكشرز في العيانين اللي سفرنج فروم ذيس ديزيز هل في ماركرز ممكن نستخدمها الحقيقه ماركرز كتيره قوي ماركرز للبون فورميشن وماركرز للبون ريزوربشن لكن الاهم فيهم هو البون سبيسيفيك الكلاين فوسفاتيز ده اللي موجود اعتقد وده اللي يعني يبقى اوف اوف كلينيكال براكتس وده اللي موجود في الجايد لاينز بتاعه الكديكو Uh, how to uh, يعني how to screen او او الفريكونس اوف سكريننج اعتقد انه الدكتوره ايمان اتكلمت امبارح على الجايد لاينز بتاعت السكريننج لكن uh, بنؤكد انه um, as we go down in the grading او as we go down in the staging of CKD كل ما السكيدي ستيجنج بيزيد كل ما الفريكونس اوف اسسمنت بتزيد وده مهم لانه التشنجز بتبقى اسرع والعيان بيبقى فريكونتلي ميديكيتد وبدا يخش اون دايلسيس اينفر بي دي اور اتش دي هي دايلسيس فبيحتاج more frequent monitoring. ال ال levels ايه المطلوب انه انا اقول للعيان بتاعي ده كده كويس ولا كده وحش ايه المطلوب بتاعنا انه الكيديجو جايد لاينز قالت في 2017 انه الكوريكتد كالسيوم شود بي ان ذا تارجت رينج التارجت رينج اللي هو من 8.5 لحد 10.5 البريفيرابل 9 9.5 
الفوسفورس نير نورمال الفوسفورس شود بي ليس ذان 5 البي تي اتش من 2 تايمز لحد 9 الابر نورمال يعني النورمال اب تو 70 يبقى من 150 اب تو 600 يعتبر نورمال في البيشنت اون دايلس So what about phosphorus? The phosphorus, the fact, from the things that 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 has a dilemma, a little bit, because phosphorus is present in two forms: organic form and inorganic form. The inorganic form is very common. It's present in all the food additives, in dietary supplements, in soda, in the things that we drink. It gets absorption up to 90%. And for the fact, it is harmful phosphorus. Organic phosphorus, when it is present in daily products, in meat, in fish, in soy, in nuts. مهم ان انا ارستريكت الفوسفورس انتاج اقل من 8 على 10 جرام بندي يعني اقل من 800 ملغ بير دي واركز على الدايتر انتاج ابعد عن الانورجانيك فوسفورس واركز على الاورجانيك فوسفورس طبعا في العيانين اللي اون دايلسيز البروتين انتاج بيبقى ازيد شويه يعني احنا بنقول للعيان اللي نوت اون دايلسيز قلل البروتين انتاج من 6 من 10 ل 8 من 10 جرام بير كي جي بير دي لكن on dialysis we can reach up to 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per day. 1.2 1.5 gram protein not uh, not gram meat. لو أنا هقلبها meat يبقى 1.5 gram protein أعتقد أو equals four times meat يعني لو هياخد 70 جرام protein أضرب في أربعة يعني عاوز 280 جرام لحم يعني تقريبا ربع كيلو أو ثلث كيلو لحم. فاحنا لازم نبقى فاهمين الكونتنت بتاعت الاتش تايب اوف فود و ديزاين التايلور الدايتري ريجيمنت بتاع البيشنت اكوردنج تو هيز ريكوايرمنت اكوردنج للبادي ماس اكوردنج للاكتيفيتي اكوردنج للايج فوكسنج في الفوسفورس على الاورجانيك فوسفورس افويدنج الان اورجانيك فوسفورس از ماتش از وي كان الفوسفيت بايندرز اللي موجوده عندنا كتير عندنا كالسيوم كونتيننج فوسفيت بايندرز ونان كالسيوم كونتيننج فوسفيت بايندرز الكالسيوم كونتيننج الكالسيوم كربونات والكالسيوم اسيتات النون كالسيوم كونتيننج اللي افيلبل ان ايجيبت اللي هو السيفيلمر هيدروكلورايد نوت كربونات سيفيلمر هيدروكلورايد الانثرم نوت بريزنت ان ايجيبت لكن في حاجات كمان اللي هي الفيريك سيتريت والساكروفيريك اوكسي هيدروكسيد الحاجات دي البوتنس بتاعتها ميجرد اكوردنج او ان كومباريزون ل 1 جرام كالسيوم كربونات يهم يهمنا ان احنا نبقى عارفين الدوزج يعني انا لما بدي للعيان كالسيوم كربونات الايم بتاعي انه اكوريكت الكالسيوم اور اتريت الهايبوفوسفاتيميا هايبرفوسفاتيميا وايه هو الايكوفالنت دوزنج فور ايتش تايب اوف اوف ذيس دراجز هل الفوسفات ريموفد باي دايلسيس اوف كورس الدايلسيس سيشن اللي بتقعد اربع ساعات تقريبا البر ويك بيتشال من 2 و3 من 10 ل 2.5 جرام فوسفات ده لو احنا خلينا السيشن اربع ساعات لو ضعفنا التايم خليناها 8 ساعات هيتشال من 3 ل 3.5 جرام بير ويك. البروتينال دايلسيس بيشيل اقل شويه من 2 ل 2.2 جرام فوسفورس بير ويك. يبقى الدايلسيس مهم والاربع ساعات مهمين والثري تايمز بير ويك مهمين ان انا ستيك تو تايم واستيك للفريكونسي واف اي كان انكريز الفريكونسي اف افيلبل ان انا انكريز الفريكونسي انكريز الفريكونسي بتاعت الدايلسيس. وات اباوت سكندري هايبر باراثيروديزم؟ السكندري هايبر باراثيروديزم اول حاجه لازم اكوريكت الفوسفوس الكالسيوم واظبط الدايت بتاعت العيان بعد ما اعمل الحاجات دي يبقى الحاجه الثانيه اللي مهمه لو انا هستخدم فوسفيت بايندر وي سجست ريستريكتنج ذا دوز اوف كالسيوم كونتيننج فوسفيت بايندرز ليه بنريستريكت الكالسيوم دوزنج او بنبعد عن الفوسفيت بايندرز اللي فيها كالسيوم لانه بتزود الكالسيفيكيشن وسواء فاسكولار كالسيفيكيشن او التيشو كالسيفيكيشن Uh, if uh, you are going to use uh, uh, a phosphate binder, uh, major serum calcium first. If there is hypocalcemia, use a calcium containing phosphate binder. If there is no hypocalcemia, well, I'm eucalcemic or hypercalcemic, avoid the calcium containing and go to the non calcium containing phosphate binders. Use a dialysate with low calcium, uh, 1.25 millimole or 1.5 millimole. When to go for uh, uh, parathyroidectomy, if the IPTH intact parathyroid is more than uh, 800 severe hyperparathyroidism, Severe hypercalcemia or hyperphosphatemia, the uh, enlargement of the parathyroid gland, uh, or previous resistance to active vitamin D and its analogs. I go on to the treatment of hyperparathyroidism. One of the lines is the sinacalcet, or we call it calcimimetics. We have uh, 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 two types of, of, of calcimimetics: anticalcetide and sinacalcet. Sinacalcet is oral, anticalcetide is intravenous. Uh, intravenous. السينا كالسيت بتاخد اورال افري داي لكن السينا كالسيت بتاخد اسف الايتيكالسيتايد 
ناخد يعني ثرايس بير ويك انترافينوسلي افتر هيموداليسيس تشن في الايفو كالسيتايب ده اورال تريتمنت ابروفد ان جابان الدراجز دي بتعمل الوستيك موديوليشن للكالسيتايب Uh, uh, وبتستخدم في علاج الهايبر باراثيروديزم uh, بس لازم when we treat a patient with cynical set we consider the cost لانه very costly regarding the economic status in Egypt uh, they, they cause severe hypocalcemia فالمانجمنت بتاعت والميجرنج اوف سيرم كالسيوم از مانداتوري مع اليوز بتاع السينكال ست بيعمل بالمونار هايبرتنشن فلازم نتابع العيانين بتوعنا بيكو بيعمل جاستريك ابسيت فلازم ابقى مفاهم العيان السايد افكتس دي ار كومن ويز The use of calcium emetics. What about calcium? Calcium is mainly treatment, the main line of treatment, by giving calcium-containing phosphate binders or vitamin D if needed, or if there is there isn't hypo hyperphosphatemia. If there is hyperphosphatemia, the use of the vitamin D not recommended. And of course, if I use cinnamon. بي اوجمنت الانسيدنس اوف هايبر كالسيميا لو انا بستخدم سينا كالسيوم الدوز بتاعته لو السيرم كالسيوم اقل من 8.4 لكن لو السيرم كالسيوم اقل من 8 او 7.5 سينا كالسيوم شود بي ويف هولد التوتال دوز اوف سوري التوتال انتيك اوف كالسيوم بير داي ايذر باي اورال لود او باي دايتري سبلمنتيشن او باي التريتمنت يعني الميديكال تريتمنت شودنت اكسيد 2 جرامز بير داي Uh, what about a dynamic bone disease? A dynamic bone disease, uh, the problem here is there is no uh, bone division. So we need to stimulate the bone. The uh, stimulation of the bone could be by stopping the calcium emetics, stopping or decreasing the dose of vitamin D or vitamin D analogs, the change in calcium containing phosphate binders to non calcium containing, giving something like PTH, which is tiliparatide or apalloparatide or uh, verona calcite, is a calcilytic. I think it's not present in the market. <clears throat> Uh, is there a CKD, MBD, post transplantation? Yes, it could be a continuity of the previous disease present in patients on dialysis. A yani patient went for renal transplantation, successful renal transplantation, but is still suffering from secondary hyperparathyroidism, still suffering from some disorders of the bone that occurred before the renal transplantation, uh, may be aggravated by some drugs like steroids, which are used post transplant. So, yes, CKD, MBD could persist after renal transplantation. Bone fragility and osteoporosis will be discussed today by uh, Dr. Mohamed Mandouh, our colleague. So I'm going to, uh, to skip it uh, um, and uh, the indications of bone biopsy, inshallah. Um, uh, last, uh, inshallah, uh, th this uh, slide, the news that came out the advancement of the sistership with the University of Kentucky in the USA, the level B. الحقيقة uh, congratulations for all the, uh, the team of our unit. Thanks, Dr. Amr, for the support. ونرجو إن شاء الله يحصل مزيد من الأدفانسمنت بمجهودكم وبمجهود الزملاء الأعزاء. Thank you for all. I hope أن أكون عملت a good presentation إن شاء الله. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Abdel Wahab, for this nice presentation. I will let Dr. Uh, Mustafa Abdel Salam and Dr. Rasha uh, Samir to moderate the session and to uh, try to handle the question with Dr. Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to Professor Ahmed Hussein and the organizing committee for their sincere efforts and for inviting me to participate in the course. And I'd like to thank Dr. Ahmed Abdel Wahab for the comprehensive, elegant talk. And I have a couple of questions. I, in considering um, hyperphosphatemia or management of hyperphosphatemia as one of the pillars of management of CKD and VD, and in view of uh, existing concern regarding the um, presence of significant proportions of phosphate in some commonly used medications in hemodialysis patients, um, as some antihypertensive medications uh, in both branded and generic forms of uh, uh, amlodipine, uh, lysinopril, uh, colinidine. Um, some um, uh, antidiabetic as uh, cetagliptin, uh, rosuvastatin as um, lipid lowering agent. So I'd like to ask if would you recommend uh, against the use of these medications in uh, hemodialysis patients with hyperphosphatemia? Um, the presence of phosphorus content inside the medications which we use in the treatment, current treatment. 
of of CKD uh, special imbalances. Um, I don't think in the level of phosphorus in these drugs could uh, uh, pose a harm to our patients. This is number one. Number two, if it is mandatory, we can replace. Yani, uh, I know the amlodipine some, has some content of phosphorus. Um, yani it could be replaced by another drug that doesn't contain uh, phosphorus. Uh, if we are speaking about lipid lowering agents, uh, uh, it's not common to be used in patients with end stage kidney disease and not recommended in the guidelines unless our patient is suffering from a cardiac disease, a previous cardiac disease that necessitates the use of lipid lowering agents, statins, I mean. Statins is not recommended as a regular line of treatment in patients with uh, our own dialysis. Um, again, uh, good dialysis, uh, good dialysis, I mean good in time and good in, in, uh, in uh, frequency, um, will remove, like I said, about three grams of phosphorus per day uh, or per week. And good dietary control of the phosphorus present in the diet, which poses, I think, a more harm to our patients uh, will make the, the, the issue of controlling the hyperphosphatemia more palatable to our patients. Uh, to Dr. Ahmad, we have a question from the floor uh, regarding the maximum dose of uh, daily calcium. Yes, I, I said in the lecture that the total dose of calcium per day, uh, the total amount of calcium intake per day is two grams. If we calculated the dose we get from calcium from uh, in medications, Let's say uh, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, uh, uh, the, the capsule of calcium carbonate, uh, calcimat, uh, contains 500 milligrams. The elemental calcium in the 500 milligrams is 250. Calcium acetate is 700 milligrams. The elemental calcium represents 233. So we should know what is the, the elemental calcium content of each step. Let's say we prescribed our patient uh, four types of calcium, of calcimate, calcium carbonate. This means one gram, one gram of calcium carbonate by uh, given by uh, in, in medication. So I should uh, restrict the calcium in diet to be at least one gram also. If, uh, uh, to, to, to know uh, how much we give calcium per day, we should know uh, the elemental calcium content of each tab we give to our patients. The two commonest drugs present in Egypt are calcimate, calcium carbonate. The content of elemental calcium is 250 milligrams. Regarding the calcium acetate, the whole Markel in Egypt, the elemental calcium is less 233, I think. Okay, Dr. Ahmed, another question is regarding the upper level of vitamin D in hemodialysis patients. يعني, ال, 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 the, the normal level starts from 30 and I think to, to 100, and our patient should be above 30 if we are speaking about the vitamin D three stores. Uh, I, I think we should be above 30. Uh, not reaching to 100, I think uh, exceeding, uh, uh, I, I don't know the, the upper limit, I don't remember it if Dr. Amr or Dr. Ala can, can give us uh, uh, a note about that, but I think I should be above 30. Um, another question is regarding how do we diagnose hypo or hypermagnesemia clinically? It's not in the scope of the lecture, but um, the manifestations of, of hypomagnesemia is like hypocalcemia. Uh, magnesium and calcium are mainly important for uh, the neuromuscular transmission and neuromuscular activity. So hypomagnesemia is going to manifest like, like a hypocalcemia, uh, muscle twitches, parathesia around the, the mouse, and in severe cases, uh, uh, it may predispose to uh, uh, attacks of convulsions. Hypermagnesemia has stages. Yani, there are stages of hypermagnesemia starting with uh, a mild to moderate to severe hypermagnesemia. Mild hypermagnesemia is associated with hyporeflexia. Uh, moderate hypermagnesemia is associated with respiratory muscle, uh, sorry, uh, skeletal muscle paralysis. And severe hypermagnesemia is associated with respiratory failure. And uh, uh, in severe cases, uh, when magnesium level exceeds 10, uh, it may lead to deep coma. Of course, uh, measuring magnesium is very important uh, in this population. Uh, hypermagnesemia uh, is not uh, occurring uh, except in patients with CKD. Yani it's very difficult to occur in a patient with a normal kidney function. So do you recommend checking magnesium levels monthly? It's not in the guidelines. Um, and uh, yani, uh, we have a study made in, in, uh, in our unit. Uh, I think Dr. Iman Nagy was uh, the main researcher. 
um, that showed that most of the dialysis patients didn't suffer from hypermagnesemia. Uh, also, our, our dialysis uh, dialysate content of, of magnesium is low. So um, I, I don't recommend the checking serum magnesium every month, no. Uh, Dr. Rasha, do we have uh, still time for uh, discussion for Dr. Ahmed? I need a comment from Prof. Dr. Nagab Hadi. He, is, he put a comment. So we need to hear from our professor. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Amr, uh, يعني, we wish to hear, to hear from you. If Dr. Uh, Nagy wants to, to put a comment, Dr. Nagy is, is with us if he has a comment. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just in, uh, in, uh, in relation to the question about the dose of, uh, of calcium, the maximum dose, actually we should be guided by serum calcium. We should measure serum calcium. And if the serum calcium exceeds 9.5, I would say, I, I, I would stop uh, giving calcium uh, altogether. But if serum calcium is still low, something like even 7, 7.5, and I'm giving uh, uh, high dose of calcium, I can even increase the dose. So uh, please be guided by serum calcium before you prescribe uh, any any calcium containing This is what I want to say. The, the lecture is elegant, actually, Ahmed. Congratulations. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, thanks for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, first, regarding the uh, serum level of uh, vitamin D and uremic patient. I don't think there is any difference between uremic and non-uremic regarding the uh, international, I mean, guidelines uh, for the serum level. Uh, below uh, 20, as you know, I mean, uh, it will, it will, the patient will be classified as vitamin D insufficiency and below 30, it will be classified as uh, vitamin D, uh, vitamin D uh, insufficiency. So you should correct the vitamin D uh, deficiency in such patients. I don't know if, uh, if Amr agree with me or have any other opinion. So I think the, the level of uh, seri, I mean the number of seri, is uh, uh, as the non-uremic. Would you like me to, to comment? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah I, uh, before the vitamin D, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Ahmed, for this nice presentation. Um, the question about how much calcium we should give, this is actually a dangerous, uh, scary question. We shouldn't give calcium for our patient, except if they have severe or symptomatic hypocalcemia. Our CKD patients are on a positive calcium balance. So don't think Agreed. that they are calcium deficient. Even if they are a little bit hypocalcemic, the calcium balance is different from the serum calcium level. You can have high calcium level with a negative calcium balance and vice versa. There is no correlation between the serum calcium level and the calcium balance. So it's 99% of the calcium goes to the bone and the 1% is distributed between the intracellular and extracellular component, 90% to go to intracellular and only the almost one out of a thousand is the extracellular calcium concentration because it's distributed between albumin bound and non-albumin bound. So it's what we see or what we are assessing in the serum is one out of a thousand of the calcium content. And of course, because we don't do calcium balance study, so we don't do a stool, in the calcium and urine calcium, and we don't measure the calcium intake. So we don't have any idea how the calcium balance is going on in our patient. But you know, the bottom line is our patients are on a majority of them, the vast majority of them are on a positive calcium balance. We shouldn't give calcium. I want uh, you, uh, Ahmed, to go back to the trade-off hypothesis, if you can share again your slide and show us the old and the new trade of hypothesis. And you can see that even the calcium was taken out from the equation. In the past, hypocalcemia was one of the major determinant and the major uh, predictor for secondary hyperbara and for renal osteodystrophy. Now it's not, it disappeared. Now it's all about FGF23 and phosphorus and the positive calcium and phosphorus balance. So please don't give 
any extra calcium to your CKD vision or dialysis vision. Calcium containing phosphate binder is another discussion. Okay, you can give calcium with the food and the absorption of this calcium of this calcium as phosphate lowering therapy is, is minimal because you give it with the food, you don't give it as a calcium sovereign. That's a different story. We can talk about calcium containing versus non-calcium containing phosphate lowering therapies, but don't give calcium as supplement. Uh, this is number one. Uh, number two, the vitamin D. I agree that uh, there is no specific uh, uh, you know, guideline or uh, target level for the vitamin D and dialysis vision, just to keep the same uh, level, which is usually 30 uh, uh, um, um, nanogram per ml. And as you can see here, Dr. Ahmed uh, uh, shared his screen. See the recent concept, the, the red thing, there is all, this is, this is called thread of hypothesis. So the old thread of hypothesis, you can see serum calcium in the middle was a focus of the thread of hypothesis. Now, if you look to the right side, the recent thread of hypothesis, where is the, white, where is the calcium here? Calcium disappeared. So the role of hypocalcemia, we don't see hypocalcemia, you know, usually in our dialysis vision, except if they are severely hypoalbuminemic or severely acidotic, or in cert certain circumstances when they come with severe uremia, but regular CKD patient, dialysis patient are not usually hypocalcemic and they are actually on a positive calcium balance. Do we still have time for, uh, for comments? I, I think we yeah. run out of time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so we leave the, the rest of the comment, I think, to the end of this session. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Mohammed Sobh and Dr. Nagy uh, Abdel Hadi uh, is moderating the uh, next uh, session, which is a case presentation by uh, Dr. Nihal Atif. Please, Dr. Sobha and Dr. Nagy. Can you stop sharing, please, Dr. Ahmed? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, we are ready. Dr. Sofar, Dr. Nagy, would you like to introduce Nihal? I leave this for uh, uh, Dr. Nagy. Okay, right. Okay, uh, I, 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 I would like to introduce uh, my dear daughter, Nihal. She is uh, one of the clever, one of the cleverest uh, nephrology actually in, uh, in, in our unit. And she's been uh, trained a lot on peritoneal dialysis uh, in Italy. And she is uh, now presenting a case on aluminum bone disease, uh, uh, Nihal, yalla. Please. As well, Terence, also know? in the CKD MBD uh, section. Uh, uh, I will add. Uh, uh, can I add something? Yes. Of can course, I sir. add something? Absolutely, sir. Oh uh, yeah, Nihal as well is doing a, a, a very uh, hard work uh, uh, with her uh, CBD patient. I would like to uh, thank her for this uh, effort, uh, and I hope for her uh, great success in this difficult area in nephrology. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. First, I'm not sure what I'm talking about after the name of Dr. Nagy and Dr. Mohamed Sobh. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. Thank you. Thank you to all my colleagues, Dr. Amr Hussaini, Dr. Alaa, Dr. Aghada, Dr. Ahmed Abdel Wahab, Dr. Mustafa Abdel Salam. Shukran uh, lagim gamian. Today uh, I will uh, present with you, discuss with you a case of aluminum bone disease. Uh, our, uh, uh, this case, uh, as we know, aluminum bone disease was a very uh, common uh, disease in the dialysis patient in the last decades. But in the last era, there was it, it was disappeared from uh, uh, the dialysis session, session after uh, the RO system developed. 
Uh, but uh, today we will discuss a case uh, which surprising all our team, which was the 68 years old male have three of spring, they retired, the goes the smoker and not alcoholic. He was the hypertensive 20 years ago and started hemodialysis five years ago, uh, which preceded by four years of gradual chronic kidney disease, which mainly uh, due to hypertensive nephropathy. His drug uh, hi history was beta blocker and amlodipine for hypertension and famotidine, a calcium carbonate, which was taken away from food for hypocalcemia and either therapy, aronisb 60 microgram per week, uh, which uh, was increased gradually due to resistant anemia. Uh, our patient complained was the fatigability and diffuse bone pain for a few months with no previous fracture or fissure and anemia, which was persistent, and no dementia or other neurological manifestations. On lab investigation for our patient, uh, we found that uh, high, uh, the PTH, the parathyroid hormone, uh, along the several reading during the last year was 199, 173, and 149, all uh, is around uh, 150 uh, to 20, not more. Or less, uh, and he have a slight hypocalcemia between 7.8 to 8, and uh, uh, slightly hyperphosphatemia uh, without treatment for hyperphosphatemia and uh, uh, resistant anemia. Uh, also, total alkaline phosphatase was done, which is slightly decreased and severely decreased the vitamin D. As we see in this slide, the both hypocalcemia and vitamin D deficiency should stimulate parathyroid hormone to release. Uh, on doing a DEXA scan for the bone pain, we found that our patient was osteoporotic, and the FRASC score for this patient was uh, uh, 2.64 major osteoporotic risk and 0.6 for the hip fracture risk. So we can summarize our patient, a hemodialysis patient with dialysis duration five years ago, and realized bone pain, osteoporotic on calcium carbonate therapy, vitamin D average between 150 to 200, and hypocalcemia and slightly low alkaline phosphatase. So uh, our attendees, can you uh, think with me about what is the cause uh, and the type of the bone disorder in this patient? Uh, returning to the lab again, we have a PTH, which is not so high. So some of us will say that uh, this patient have no high a parathyroid hormone, so it's not high turnover bone disease. And the other team will say that it's also not low to say that the patient have a dynamic bone disease. For this debate, uh, we uh, consult Dr. Amr about this case and the decision of bone biopsy was taken and was performed from the left iliac crest after double tetracycline labeling. And this is <clears throat> the histological finding report for our patient. As we see in the first picture, this is the red one. Uh, the red line is the osteoid volume, which is so thick and high osteoid volume in this patient. And the bluish one is the mineralization, which is vague. As we see, there is a defective mineralization with high osteoid volume in this patient. And the next picture also the same, high osteoid volume as we see all this as we showing you, and the blue one, which is defective mineralization, so the patient have osteomalacia. Then on a fluorescent light microscopic examination for the patient for the tetracycline uh, labeling, we found that we see only single label, not two, which is the blue line, as we showed you. This one is the one single label, and we can distinguish between two lines. As we do double dose of tetracycline, which should be absorbed by the newly formed bone, to see, uh, we should see two lines. And when we see only single lines, this meaning that we have no newly formed bone. And after that, they do uh, 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 aluminum staining for the bone biopsy. And as we see here, uh, there is aluminum deposition all over the side of the surface of the bone. Uh, this is the red one. As, the, as you see, this, this line is the red, and this one, this is discovered about 80% of the bone surface, aluminum deposition. So the diagnosis was 
mixed uremic osteodystrophy with reveling mineralization defect and aluminum accumulation with low turnover, severely defective mineralization, and low volume. After that, we do serum aluminum level for our patient to know what the serum level of this patient, which was 14, and the normal should be less than 10, but also 14, not so high number, because this patient have a chronic aluminum intoxication. So the aluminum uh, deposit inside the tissue without it ser high serum level. So the better to do uh, what's called post dysphorexamine aluminum level, which is called dysphorexamine test. So we have now two questions. The first is, what is the source of aluminum that that patient was exposed to to remove the exposure? And the second, how I can remove this aluminum from his tissues? About the source of aluminum, we start to thinking about it. At first, the most common cause of aluminum intoxication the dialysis patient was the dialysate water. Uh, so we check the dialysate concentration for aluminum and we get revised our report from our lab and we found that in our report we have no aluminum in our dialysate water as we see here no aluminum level so this the first cause which is the most common is not present in our patient the second uh, the aluminum containing phosphate binder and antacid and other drugs which can uh, which may contain aluminum in its uh, tablet uh, we found that patient have uh, uh, no history of taking a long duration of aluminum containing phosphate binder or aluminum containing antacids uh, what about it using aluminum containing utensils, they are patient using it, but if it uh, uh, may be a source uh, for uh, aluminum intoxication, like this case, or no, some studies say that it may have an effect and some say no. And if using a tap water in Egypt without using a filter may be a cause for aluminum intoxication, as in Egypt, we use what's called aluminum sulfate, which is called shabba, to purificate water and uh, remove the, uh, any dirt from it. And this aluminum sulfate dissolves inside the water. Then the patient drink it without any filter removing it in home. After that, the patient with chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease have no kidney function to remove uh, and get rid of aluminum in, in urine. So the aluminum absorb it and deposit it inside a uh, several tissue inside his body. So it's time for discussion. What's your opinion about this? يا ريت يعني اساتذتنا يقولوا لنا رايهم ايه ممكن يكون السورس اولا بتاع الالمنم انتوكسيكيشن ان اور بيشنت ايه البيشنت عنده هيفي الالمنم انتوكسيكيشن اباوت 80% اوف هيز بون سيرفيس كفرد باي الالمنم ف رايكم ايه ممكن ادي رايي طبعا يا دكتور حمد ممكن طبعا يا فندم اتفضل يا فندم اتفضل بس في مشكله عندي فنيه كده فمش ببقاش واثق ان انا اون لاين يعني اعتقد في كذا حاجه هنا عايز اقولها ان انفايرمنتال بوليوشن ويتش ار كومن انفايرمنت ويتش ار ليفنج ان كود بي ذا مين سورس اوف ذيس الومنيوم انتوكسيكيشن اند اي ثينك ذيس بروبلم از اكستريملي ان يعني needs much work to know its depths. It is a major problem, could be a major problem in our patient, and we are not feeling, uh, we are not evaluating uh, this problem properly, and we are not considering it properly. Uh, a, a high percentage of our patients have this aluminum in their bone, but we don't diagnose. Um, uh, in the past, we used the, usually this dysperoxamine uh, frequently uh, uh, more than recently we use it. We used it to give it, to use it as uh, dysperoxamine test. Since you're aluminium, uh, it is better to rely on the value after giving dysperoxamine. Since uh, without dysperoxamine, the level, as you, you said here, in this patient will not be, be that high. But if you give, give dysperoxamine, aluminium will go very high level. So this, for example, we have to have it in our practice. Uh, and mean in our patient should be studied more uh, 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 actively than this. I, I remember 
sorry for this detail. Uh, when I was uh, in money, he was looking at King Faisal. And you know, King Faisal in Saudi Arabia is a high, the highest level of uh, medical service in, uh, uh, in the United States, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I, I observe it, the, I usually go as a locum for two months in the summer. I observe it that they give big doses of uh, erythropoietin and I said to them, possibly you have an imminent problem. They said to me, this is impossible. You are the most sophisticated dialysis uh, uh, center in the kingdom. I said to them, no, possibly still you have the problem from environmental pollution. <clears throat> and actually I did a work there and we uh, looked for their aluminium did this for examine test, we found it high. And so we give patients uh, uh, who are not responding to uh, or using high dose of resveratrin, we gave them this for examine and we look for, uh, we look for aluminum and we look for a response to resveratrin. And actually there was a good response. And I proved that even mm. in this sophisticated hospital, there could be still a problem of aluminum intoxication. So uh, I think aluminum is a major problem. Uh, like uh, the tip of iceberg uh, needs attention from this uh, a very nice group, uh, our group uh, 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 and this unit uh, and this collaboration between uh, Department 3 and Kentucky uh, University. Aluminium problem is a big one. We are dealing or, or you are seeing only the tip of iceberg. This is my comment. Dr. Nagy, if you uh, allow me to comment. Uh, actually, if, uh, if, if it is environmental or related to tap water or whatever, would it be uh, more common than, than affecting only one patient in the unit? Uh, there is, should be something peculiar to this patient if he's alone affected by, uh, by this hi hyperaluminemia or aluminum intoxication. But we didn't it's examine it's our, uh, the rest of our patients. We have to measure the We should stimulate all... us actually to do that, Dr. Muhammad. We, we, should, no? we, should do, we should do that. We should, we you should, will be surprised. Uh, you will have, if you especially give this for examine, you will be surprised that the problem is bigger than we imagined. Uh, actually, Nagy, I can would remember. Would you allow me to early, comment, Dr. Nagy? Yeah, in, in, the early, in the early 90s, we used to do the, 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 this feral test, what we called at the time. And uh, uh, something like 30% of our patients had element while the others didn't have. We had uh, an RO at that time, and some units didn't have RO. And all the patients coming to the medical insurance clinic, uh, coming from different units, he, he used to take this file as a therapy for element toxicity. Uh, this was routinely given to them, not, not by me. Uh, I've, I've tried to stop that, and the, the patient was arguing with me about that. But any, any, anyhow, we should we should investigate the problem. Uh, if if it is environmental, then we should consider giving the patient therapeutic uh, doses of this for for the element toxicity. Doctor Nagy, if you allow me to comment, please. Right. Doctor Nagy, Doctor Amr. Father, Father, Doctor Allah. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, Nihal, for this elegant presentation. Uh, second, I, I thank, thank you very much, our godfather of nephrology, Professor Sob, for his valuable comment. But I, I, I really uh, feel miserable to find a case of alum toxicity on hemodialysis uh, in 2022. Uh, I don't think alum toxicity is very high in our patients. And a single, a single question to Professor Am. Uh, out of how many uh, bone biopsy samples we find on alum toxicity? I mean, this, this is a single patient. Out of how many uh, patients examined from Mansoura? Very good, very good question. Yeah, this is uh, a sad story. And uh, Dr. Sob, he said you will be surprised. I, I wouldn't be surprised now because we actually are going to discuss another case we have done in the, my uh, last trip to Egypt, I did also a bone biopsy in another place, not in Mansoura, it was in Cairo, and we found very similar problem. And we have done uh, several biopsies in the past, but this was for people with uh, hyperparathyroidism at the time of parathyroidectomy. So you don't anticipate this patient with severe hyperbara will have 
aluminum intoxic intoxication because actually severe hyperbara is protective. Low or adynamic bone disease actually increase the chance. Even after birth hereditary, there is much higher chance of having aluminum toxicity, but this is another discussion. Anyway, so we need to do a pilot study and we talked about that. We need to, to do um, maybe five to 10 uh, bone biopsies and aluminum levels in the serum after this furoxamine administration in at least you know five to ten patients in uh, several dialysis units. Thank you, Mamdouk, can lead this efforts because he will return back to Egypt uh, in ten days or two weeks. Then uh, with the rest of the team in our Mansoura University, they can do this efforts. And we are working on how to get somebody from the pathology. So not only one from nephrology who does one or more does the bone biopsy, but the interpretation, the handling of the specimen and cutting the specimens and uh, you know reading the pathology. Also, we are working with this. So hopefully within maybe next year or so, maybe by the end of 2022, we will have multidisciplinary team um, reading the pathology, doing the, the bone biopsy, diagnosing the bone disease accurately and precisely. So this is our target, and this is one of the our aim from this meeting and from our activities with Mansura. The problem is unseen, it's hidden, it's uh, forgotten. I actually was surprised at Dr. Sob said because even when we discussed this case before doing the bone biopsy, we didn't even consider aluminum intoxication. Dr. Alaa was asking, uh, apart from how many, I, I will tell you that our histopathologist, she just retired this year, she practiced for more than 40 years. She said she never have seen such aluminum staining in the bone for 35 years. The last one was from Africa and uh, she was surprised. When we reviewed the literature, I, I don't think we'll have time, Nihal actually have very good review of literature, but in other countries, Brazil, and Dr. Sobh mentioned Saudi Arabia, there was Dr. Samir Horib. I saw he published uh, one article and I saw another article, both were published 1997, 1998, if I remember correctly. And they showed that 60% of their vision has aluminum staining. Again, this was old. We didn't have anything you know, from the Arab countries or Middle Eastern countries in the last 20, 25 years. But I think this is a time because we just forgot and we thought with the new RO system and water treatment units, we get rid of this aluminum. But it seems we still have a huge problem because the two cases, the last two cases we have done in Egypt showed aluminum staining. That's that's very, uh, you know, warning sign. Dr. Amr, when we have a case of alum toxicity, I mean, a CKD patient on hemodialysis, we should think that the etiology is uh, one of either uh, we have a defect in the uh, water treatment unit, or secondary, it is alum from another pools. Since we are following the uh, the AAMI for uh, water purifications, and I think Nihal showed us a, a, a table about the result of our analysis, and it showed that uh, the water is pure, which cannot confirm that it is 100% pure. But anyway, we should think about another cause. And we have a question from Dr. Khalid al Zorkan about the drugs that contain uh, alum. It's not only the uh, alum containing phosphate binders. If any help, please revise the up to date about the uh, alum containing drugs. There are a long list of drugs. And I was uh, surprised there, to revise them. You know, Estrobiotin, aspirin, calcium carbonate. A, a vitamin D, and these are all the drugs who are given to our patients. So why not this drug to be attributed to such a case? Uh, absolutely, uh, I, I agree, but the magnitude of water exposure during the halysis, as we know as nephrologists, it, it is huge. It's 100,000 times, you know, uh, falls higher than anything else, including aluminum containing antacids, aluminum containing other drugs, including the Shabba that uh, mentioned by Nihal in the water. It seems we love Shabba in Egypt. They bought a lot of Shabba and this Shabba is just aluminum uh, phosphate. So 
it clears the water Sweet. so the people cannot complain and go because if you see the water dirty, you know, it's uh, it's very bad. So they bought a lot of uh, shabba that cleared the water. The water looks very clear, looks very nice, but it has a lot of aluminum. It's okay for people with normal kidney function, but if, because the kidney, the, the aluminum is very, you know, highly filterable and highly excretable in the kidney. But when the patient doesn't have kidney function, this will be retained. Again, we, we, we need to do, I, I don't have evidence, I don't have, you know, information. So we need to do study. I, I think also my second step is not to only do bone biopsy, but to take water samples from the RO system. And we do also take blood samples from the patient and test it here uh, in our program because I have problem trusting the results of all, all RO system in Egypt. They give you very good numbers. I, I have a problem uh, you know, uh, accepting that. So we might just need to verify. Uh, we don't think they are a liar or anything. Maybe there's a problem in the methodology, something happened. So we need to double check it in another place. And this will be also the next step. I think uh, we, we will have another case flow. So we, the, the door is still open. Uh, I think okay, uh, hey, now- hey, and it's the best fit in a slide take home message. Uh, we, we'll keep it till no the end in hell because we are uh, 15 okay. minutes behind. I'm sorry. Oh, so uh, now, uh, Dr. Mamdouh, uh, Mohammed Mamdouh Abdelbari, uh, his lecture will be uh, introduced by Dr. Ala and Dr. Ahmed Magdi. Ahmed, please go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hi, Dr. Amr. Uh, hi, um, all my uh, dear professors. Um, really, I am delighted to introduce my uh, smart colleague, uh, Mohammed Mamdouh. Um, you will know that he is an ISN fellow uh, with Dr. Uh, Amr. Um, uh, I, I'm really, I'd yani, like to thank Dr. Amr about his uh, constructive efforts in the sistership and supporting Mamdouh in the uh, field of the bone biopsy, the uh, clinical research and clinical practice and osteoporosis. Uh, he is really a role model for uh, 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 establishing and maintaining a, a high quality of medical education. Uh, uh, Mamdouh, I think he deserved by his uh, effort and by his work uh, this uh, very good chance. Uh, I'll promise you that uh, uh, you will enjoy the next talk. Uh, so go to the Mamdouh quickly for sake of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Salam alaikum, everyone. It is an honor to give you some hints about management of osteoporosis in patient with CKD. Our talk agenda is what is osteoporosis? Why osteoporosis in CKD patient is so important? How does osteoporosis happen in CKD patient? And how to diagnose what are the options for treatment and our take home message? According to WHO operational definition, osteoporotic patient has bone mineral density of equal or more than 2.5 standard deviation below the normal mean. It is equal to T score uh, of minus 2.5 or less. The normal mean was, cal was calculated from BMD measurements in young adult white women. And this definition, as you can see, it focuses only on bone quantity and neglects anything about bone quality. But they said they aim to establish the prevalence of osteoporosis with, with this definition. And they stated that it shouldn't be used as the sole determinant of treatment decision. They said the scores adjusted for ethnicity or race should be used, which I think hadn't been done. In 2000, the National Institute of Health defined osteoporosis as a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength, predisposing to increased fracture risk. And as you can see, the bone strength could involve both bone quantity and bone quality. And we have the clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis. So the presence of a fragility fracture, irrespective of BMD, can diagnose the patient with osteoporosis. The fragility fracture is a fracture which can happen from a fall of a standing height or less without no major trauma. It is not like a motor car, a motor car accident fracture. The National Bone Health Alliance recommends that diagnosis could be made in USA using the FRAX scoring system. 
if the 10 year probability of major osteoporotic fracture is equal or more than 20% or 10 year probability of hip fracture is equal or more than 3%, you could diagnose this patient with osteoporosis even if you don't have the BMD of this patient. So why osteoporosis in CKD patient is so important? In general population, osteoporotic fracture have, uh, have high burden on disability. You can see osteoporotic fracture is second to uh, colon cancer, liver cirrhosis, diabetes, COPD. So it is it has a very high burden. And in patient with CKD, it is much worse. Patient with GFR less than 60 milli per minute, they have at least twice higher risk of osteoporosis. This risk increases with the decline of kidney function, ending that in the stage of kidney disease patients, they have four to six fold of fracture risk compared to matched population. And when our patient fracture, they have double risk of mortality. And it is not only about the bone. In the past, we know that bone is a buffer for minerals. So bone loss will lead to accumulation of minerals to the circulation. These minerals can be predisposed to vascular calcification. Now, there is a growing evidence of a bone vascular axis, which is working in both direction. How does osteoporosis happen in CKD? We know that bone is a dynamic tissue undergoing constant remodeling throughout lifespan. So when you are young and healthy, there is a balance between bone resorption and bone formation. This ends up with healthy and normal bone. But when you have imbalance between osteoporosis, uh, imbalance between bone resorption and the bone formation, you would end up with osteoporosis. You could, you could have either very high bone resorption. If you have very, uh, if you have high turnover, you could, you could have very high bone resorption, or you could have low turnover, which ended with very low bone formation. As Dr. Ahmed Abdul Wahab said in his lecture, we have the turnover mineralization and volume. So we have two categories of turnover, which is high turnover, at least two categories, and low turnover. The pathogenesis of osteoporosis in CKD patient is complex. Because CKD patients, they have many risk factors for osteoporosis, beginning with the disturbing gonadal hormones. They have a menu of uremic toxins and the metabolic acidosis. The use of medication in this, in this patient, many medication can be predisposed to osteoporosis and we use them like frequently in CKD patient, like uh, BBI, like warfarin, uh, diuretics, like uh, immune suppressive in uh, transplant kidney uh, patient. And on one side, there are many factors which could lead to low turnover bone disease, beginning with advanced age of our patient, presence of diabetes, our overuse of calcium, VDRAs, and the calcium mimetic, or aluminum intoxication. And in, in early stages of CKD, patient could have a BTH resistance, which could end up with low turnover osteoporosis. On the other side, there is an increase in FGF23, which participate in the decreasing of calcitriol level, and it ends up with decreased uh, calcium and phosphate retention, and the parathyroid hyperplasia, and all of this will lead to high turnover osteoporosis. So how to diagnose osteoporosis? We have many tool, tools for diagnosis or for assessment of bone health in CKD patient, but I would stick to the most common and the most available um, tools. So DEXA is uh, widely available. I think all of us uh, know about it. And they stated that patient at high risk should be screened, but this high risk is not well defined. When Kidigo defined this high risk, it used the high risk as the general population. And in some literature, they added the long dialysis vintage to this high risk. But I think that the more screen you do is better, even if we don't have a, a very clear guidelines about, about it. And one thing to consider if you are doing DEXA is this, BMD values could be falsely higher in CKD patient. If this patient have vascular calcification, especially in the aorta, which is very common in CKD patient, you could have uh, falsely higher uh, values of BMD, especially at lumbar spine. So I would rec recommend two tools uh, we can use with the DEXA machine. One of them is trabecular bone score. I think Professor Amr Hussein talked about it yesterday. 
And the longest story short, it can give you a hint about the trabecular separation of the vertebrae, about the bone quality of the vertebrae. So you could have the same BMD, but you could have very low trabecular bone score. It is just a program used uh, an algorithm and the DEXA machine can calculate it automatically. I don't ask about it in Egypt, but I think if we ask the technician about it, they should have it. And it was approved by FDA in 2012. The next is vertebral fracture assessment. Vertebral fracture are very common. They are even higher than the hip and wrist fracture in all age distribution in CKD. And they are silent fracture. And the good thing is you don't have, uh, there is no added cost. You just have to reposition the patient to the lateral position while he's doing DEXA. So you can see if he has, uh, if this patient has any vertebral fracture. And with the same image, you could have uh, take a look at the abdominal aorta to see if this patient has vascular calcification. And the next is you can use more of FRAX score using the femoral neck BMD in the FRAX. So you can use the FRAX score without BMD or with BMD, but I would recommend that using it with BMD is better. <laughs> The next important tool is bone turnover marker. Bone turnover marker can assist turnover and they can monitor treatment as well. Uh, we should be aware of that many of them cleared by the kidney, but we have bone specific alkaline phosphatase intact beyond NB as bone formation marker, and we have TRAP 5B as bone resorption marker. They are reliable in CKD because they are not cleared by the kidney, and of course, in addition to the BTH. So you can assess the turnover of the patient, the turnover status of the patient using this biomarker, and also you can monitor the treatment with them. If you are giving the, this patient a medication to stop the bone resorption, so you would anticipate that these markers will go down. And if you are giving him a treatment to build up his bones, you would anticipate that the formation marker is going up. And the good thing is you can monitor these markers every three months. You don't have to wait one year as the DEXA scan to have uh, a change in the result. Third is the bone biopsy. It is a gold standard for renal osteodystrophy. It gives you a good, a very good information about turnover and demineralization and volume. And also the bone specimen can be used in FTIR to assess bone quality in micro CT and MRI. And there are other diagnostics like QCT and HRB QCT. So how to treat? We, we said that we have low turnover osteoporosis and the high turnover osteoporosis, but both of them, so if you have low turnover osteoporosis, you can give this patient osteoanabolics to help him increase his bone formation, to build up bone. If the patient has high turnover osteoporosis, you could begin with anti-resorbative to stop the resorption. And both categories could benefit from, sorry, non-pharmacological intervention and CKD MBD management. If you consider it as a pyramid, so the base of the pyramid would be the non-pharmacological intervention. We usually miss those intervention as a physician, but balanced diet, stopping smoking and limiting alcohol, with bearing exercise such as uh, walking or running, and the measures to prevent falls or this non-pharmacological intervention, they are easy, they are uh, no cost added to the patient and they are effective. And the first step after the non pharmacological intervention would be the CKD MBD management, as Dr. Ahmed Abdul Wahab said in his lecture. We can use the calcium, the phosphorus lowering syrups, the vitamin D and the VDRA, the calcium mimetic to achieve the best as we could of CKD MBD management. Next to this, in some selected patients, we would need anti resorbative or anabolics. So in anti-resorbative, we have bisphosphonates, the most common, dinozumab, and selective estrogen receptor mediator. On the other side, we have, for the anabolics, we have teriparatide and abeloparatide, and recently, the romosozumab. Barathyroidectomy could be used in refractory cases of hyperbarathyroid bone disease. If we want to talk about anti-resorbative, I know this figure is a bit complex, but we will talk only about uh, the most common uh, drugs. So here is the osteocyte. You can consider this as the bone. Here is the osteoblast, and here is one of the osteoblasts. 
So the bisphosphonate, they act by inhib inhibiting the osteoclast and inhibiting the osteoclast precursor. For the donosumab, donosumab act on what's called the rank L. So we have the rank and rank L pathway. When the rank L, it is receptor activator nuclear kappa beta ligand. When it attaches to its receptor, it stimulates the precursor of osteoclast and it causes bone resorption. So the denosumab is act as an antibody to the rank L, preventing it from attached, uh, attachment to rank, so it stops the osteoclast maturation and function. The serum, the serum can stimulate what's called the OBG, and the OBG is the osteoprotegrin. It is an inhibitor of the rank L, so it can inhibit the bone resorption. On the other side, we have the uh, BTH and the BTH related peptide, which is the teriparatide and the abeloparatide, they can stimulate bone formation. And we have sclerostin blocking antibody, which is uh, romosozumab. So sclerostin is a negative inhibitor of the winter pathway. The winter pathway is causing bone formation. So if we block the sclerostin, so we are increasing the bone formation. So bisphosphonates are like three generation of bisphosphonates. The second and the third generation are most common now. They are nitrogen. They are called nitrogen-based bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonates are available in many forms, like oral and IV, and in various doses from daily dose to weekly to every three months or yearly dose. It depends on which bisphosphonate you will use. But we have a concern that they, they are excreted by the kidney. So those adjustment, either by decreasing dose or decreasing frequency, may improve bone health without causing damage. But this requires more clinical data for, val for validation. We know that bisphosphonates are effective. They decrease fracture risk and security patient in most studies. But we have uh, some concern. We have the known concern, like they cause uh, some GIT upset. The concern about typical fractures, especially on long bone, the osteonecrosis of the jaw, so you should ask your patient for any blends of dental procedures such as tooth extraction or implant, and we have a major concern of a dynamic bone disease because bisphosphonate, they stay in bone for a very long time, and they could predispose a dynamic bone disease, especially when you use them for very long duration. Recently, the CKD MBD working group of the era editor, they published in the Kidney International Review, uh, they wants to say that we could use bisphosphonate more liberally in CKD patient without, uh, a fe without fearing the uh, adynamic bone disease, because they said there is no evidence that they could harm our patient. And I had the honor to participate with Professor Amr Hussein and our colleague Subh and Dr. Nahal uh, to write a letter to the editor as regards this review that the absence of evidence of harm in the study is not equal to the absence of harm. So we don't have evidence that they would cause harm in patients with a dynamic bone disease, but this is because we don't have a study, a good study to answer this question. And I, I would recommend that you uh, read this review and the letter to the editor and the commentary by uh, uh, Susan Ott and uh, Dr. Malik about it. So the second is denosumab. As we said, denosumab is a mono monoclonal antibody to rank L. Uh, dose of denosumab is subcutaneous, 60 milligram once every six months. But uh, I think it is important here to say that it is not a fixed dose for every patient. The best is to mon monitor bone turnover marker, DEXA scan, and adjust the doses interval according to it. So in the bone clinic here, for example, they could give uh, Borolea in some patient yearly, they could give it in some patient every two years. So according to the uh, level of BTMs and according to the DEXA scan of the patient, you could space the doses of the nosoma. How it differ from bisphosphonate? It doesn't become embedded within the bone tissue. It, it binds the rank L in the extracellular fluid so it could be cleared from the bloodstream with a half-life of approximately 26 days. It seems to be safer in patients with advanced stage of CKD, but we have some side effect and concern as well. First, it inhibits the rank L, which is immune system modulator, so you should be aware of infection. 
We have the same concern with atypical fracture, osteonecrosis, obstetro, but they could be less than bosphosphonate. And we have a concern of hypocalcemia because uh, the blockage of rank L prevents the osteoclast resorption of the bone. This could impair the BTH driving maintenance of the serum calcium. And it is very important to be aware of bone loss after discontinuing of denosumab. So there, there is a good evidence from the studies that after the patient stopped denosumab, the, the BMD of them, uh, uh, their BMD could worsen at a very high rate. So after stopping denosumab, you should follow patient DEXA, and it could be um, a better option to start him on another anti osteoporotic medication if he needs one. The next is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. They interact with estrogen receptor in different tissue, and we have the raloxifen and the bezadoxifen. Uh, they have high estrogen activity in the bone. The dose of raloxifen, it, it is 60, 60 milligram. It is oral tablet given once daily. And interestingly, there is some evidence that they could improve kidney function, both of raloxifen and bezadoxifen. But I could say that it is not a very uh, high quality evidence. Uh, they are less effective when they when, uh, if we compare them to bisphosphonates. So on the other side, if we talk about osteoanabolics, there is a growing evidence now that currently low turnover bone disease is the most common renal osteodystrophy pattern in CKD patient. So we have the teriparatide, which is the recombinant BTH from 1 to 34, and it is daily subcutaneous injection of 20 micrograms. But interestingly, three times a week of 20 microgram and weekly 56.5 uh, microgram not available in you as the second one. And uh, has shown in some studies that it, ha uh, it has similar benefit in hemodialysis patient, and this could improve patient compliance. The second is a baloparatide. It is a synthetic analog of BTH-related peptide, and it binds more uh, selectively to BTH type 1 receptor, so it could favor uh, bone formation without uh, with minimizing the effect of prolonged activation, so it could minimize bone resolution and hypercalcemia. So it has a better impact on lumbar spine and femoral neck in, in patient with EG of less than 60 in, some, in one of the studies. The dose of 80 micrograms subcutaneous, and it is daily injection. And the thing is, we don't have a very uh, good studies on the abalobartase, so we have only uh, a study of the post-hoc analysis of randomized control trial as regards the CKD. There are some side effects and concern as regards teleparatide and abalobartide. So the first is hypercalcemia and the hypercalciuria. Teleparatide can increase BTH level up to tenfold above baseline before returning to baseline within four hours. So if the patient has hypercalcemia or hypercalciuria, you should evaluate this patient for primary hyperbara or any other hypercalcemic disorder. We have the concern of calciphylaxis from some case report, and we have a dose-dependent increased risk of osteosarcoma in rats. This concern limited the use of teleparatide and abalobartide to 24 months only. But recently, the FDA in 2021 is no longer requiring a black box warning on the label for teleparatide about osteosarcoma. Um, third one is the romosuzumab. So romosuzumab is a monoclonal antibody against cyclorestin. It increased bone formation and reduced bone resorption. It uh, could be given as uh, 210 milligrams subcutaneous every month for 12 months. And we have some studies in mild and moderate CKD and in hemodialysis patient. A recent study from Japan showed that romosuzumab could be given in uh, to hemodialysis patient. But we have uh, a very good or a very reasonable concern about increasing vascular calcification. So the romosuzumab could increase the wind uh, busway could stimulate indirectly the winter busway. And the winter busway, it increases the bone formation and it also could increase the vascular calcification as a patient. And it shouldn't be used in, it shouldn't be initiated in patients who had MI or stroke within the preceding years. In a recent study on hemodialysis, this one was published, uh, I think, uh, 2021. Hypocalcemia was the main adverse event. There was no apparent increase in cardiovascular event, but it, this was only one year study. 
and there is no measurement of vascular calcification in this study. So our take home message is fracture risk increase with loss of kidney function. In the steady kidney disease, you have up to six fold increase in fracture risk. The pathogenesis is multifactorial, but early screening was widely available DEXA using lower threshold for T scores. So instead of using minus 2.5 and stick to it for starting the treatment, you could start the treatment in a patient with uh, minus two. And also with utilizing of TBS and uh, VFA, this could be beneficial. Consider BTH, one turnover marker, plus or minus bone biopsy to determine the turnover status. Controlling CKD MBD and the non-pharmacological intervention are two important steps before or at the time of considering bone-specific therapies. Using a precision medicine-based approach of anti-resorbative and high turnover bone disease patient and anabolics or osteoanabolics and low turnover uh, bone disease patient and monitoring treatment with BTMs and DEXA scan. This could achieve the highest efficacy with the best safety profile in patient with CKD. The last is we need further studies, especially on osteoanabolics and CKD. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mamdouh. We have, uh, I think, five minutes. If anyone has uh, any questions, because we're a little bit behind, then we'll go in a break after the five minute uh, discussion. Dr. Ala. Uh, can I have a question, Dr. Am, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, yani, uh, a great lecture as I expected. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, but I have a question uh, 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 for you regarding, regarding your experience uh, uh, those six months in the uh, um, uh, center of Dr. Am. Uh, 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 please, yani, you know that you know, you know the Egyptian circumstances. We, uh, we used a lot of the uh, anti-resorbative medications, uh, uh, especially the uh, denizumab and the bisphosphonate in the treatment of osteoporosis uh, as general and in CKD. Uh, um, so beyond the evidence, what, what's the, the center experience? Uh, um, the preference of uh, um, bisphosphonates or denizumab in the treatment of osteoporosis I don't know if you are dealing with general cases of osteoporosis or just CKD, but uh, uh, I like uh, if it is, uh, yani if you are uh, uh, treating osteoporosis, whatever the, uh, the comorbidity, um, I need the preferences in the bisphosphonate versus denizumab uh, in general population and in CKD patient if, uh, uh, if possible. Okay. Shall I answer the question, Dr. Ram? Yes, please. So, uh, I have some experience attending the bone clinic here. So the bone clinic usually um, monitors the patient who are like uh, osteoporotic. Most of the patient are post osteoporosis, which is the most common form of osteoporosis, and any other forms of osteoporosis if, if the patient is CKD or not. And I could say that uh, what happened in Egypt could happen like even in the United States, because most patients you would start on this way. So, uh, there is some evidence that most monoposal osteoporosis is usually high turnover osteoporosis. But when you talk about CKD, I would recommend that at least you know the BTH, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase for the patient. So if this patient have a very low BTH and a very low bone specific alkaline phosphatase, I would not start bisphosphonate for this patient. And if I am not sure about the turnover status, I would go with the bone biopsy, especially if the patient is CKD stage four or stage five D. So the early stages of CKD, you don't have to do this. You, the kidney guidelines would recommend that you could treat them as general population in stage one or stage two, and they suggest that you could treat them as general population in stage three if the BTH is within the normal range. But uh, my advice about this is if you are going to prescribe bisphosphonate, monitor the BTMs, monitor the bone turnover marker. If we are talking about CKD, we can use BTH, bone specific alkaline phosphatase and trap 5 p I asked one of my colleagues in clinical pathology about them and he said they are cheap, but they are not being requested from them. So if we could request these uh, biomarkers from the uh, labs in Mansoura, we could get them. It is 
uh, as he said, they are not expensive. So if you are going to prescribe anti-resorbent patient, I would recommend that you uh, could monitor the bone turnover marker and the monitor the DEXA scan. If the DEXA scan is, is improving, the patient is not having any fragility fracture and his bone turnover marker is not very suppressed, I think you can continue with bisphosphonate. But we have some evidence that longer term use of bisphosphonate more than some so maybe five years, eight years, or 10 years, they could be predisposed to impaired bone quality and um, bone loss. So I don't think if this answer your question or not, please let me, let me know. Thank you, Mandoh, very much for this uh, informative presentation. Uh, again, the message is uh, most of these uh, problems, I mean, the low bone turnover are iatrogenic. So I think prevention is better than cure, as uh, Matt said, uh, uh, in view of the high cost of most of the drugs. Uh, I have only a uh, comment regarding the uh, cares only in experimental, I mean, in rats, but I don't think there is any case reported in human. And I think there is Sorry? The osteosarcoma, so, because I couldn't... Osteosarcoma of the jaw, yeah. Yes. Uh, which, no, the osteonecrosis or the osteosarcoma? Uh, the osteonecrosis and the bone tumors that happen in rats with steriparatide. Yeah, there, there is no, uh, there is no uh, clinical evidence from uh, human studies. That is why the FDA removed the black, black box warning this year uh, or last year about the teriparatide. So you could use it now for more than two years. I agree with you. There is a very reassuring ah. review article. I think it is yes. uh, two or three months ago, yes. uh, which, which reassured the use of more than two years. Yes. Uh, uh, my question about the future therapies. Could you please just give a hint about the future therapies? So I think there are some future therapies about FGF23 and others, but I, I would recommend that we have a good studies about the current therapies because we don't have up to now a good study about abaloparatide in CKD. We don't have a good study about romosozumab in CKD. The Japanese study was like a breakthrough study. They were very brave. They studied it in hemodialysis patient, but it was not, I think it was not randomized controlled study. It was only in 76 patient and they only followed this patient for one year. So I would recommend that we can do more research and do more studies about the current medication. This medication, even the bisphosphonate, they are not very well studied in CKD patient, especially in a patient with different uh, spectrum of turnover. What about the anti-FGF-23 antibodies? Yeah, I know it is. it is, it could be promising in CKD patient, but there is no, no, uh, there is uh, uh, no clinical studies about it in, in CKD. But I would, if if I have the option, I would do a study about the Romosuzumab in CKD patient because it is available if they are approved and we have a good evidence from general population. And up till now, we don't have evidence from CKD pre-dialysis stage four or five uh, or five pre-dialysis. And we have in, in hemodialysis, we have only this Japanese study without measurement of vascular calcification and with very short follow-up. Uh, I thank Dr. Ala and Dr. Ahmed. Thank, thank you, Mandu, for uh, this nice presentation. I think for the sake of the time, we have to stop here. Uh, we are going uh, uh, to take a break for 10 minutes. Uh, please stay um, around. Don't uh, uh, get out, don't sign out. Stay in the Zoom meeting. And we have very good news about uh, evaluation of the course and about announcement of the next courses and about the certificates, the, this meeting certificates. And uh, we'll take, uh, uh, we'll have a discussion after a case presentation, then we'll summarize and conclude our meeting. So uh, please stay with us. We'll go on 10 minutes break and come back. Thank you. Thank you. interesting case 
uh, of bone loss and osteoporosis and uh, history of bone fracture and end stage kidney disease patient. And actually we will have our um, uh, great histomorphometrist and histopathologist, Dr. Mary Claude. She is going to describe the bone biopsy uh, results that we have for this patient. Go ahead, Karima. السلام عليكم اول حاجه عايزه اشكر دكتور عمر ودكتور ياسر عبد الحميد ده اول حاجه لان هم ساعدونا جامد جدا في الحاله دي بالنسبه لنا بسم الله كيس برزنتيشن دكتور عمر الو اه ميل بيشنت 24 ييرز اولد نو سبيشال هابيتس اوف ميديكال امبورتنس الكومبلينت ديفيكالت ووكينج The present history is these patients have at the age of 15 years old a change in food shaped with nocturnal enuresis, but he didn't seek any medical advice. But uh, three years later, at uh, 2015, patient developed dyspnea, bilateral bitting lower limb edema with a headache and oligodia. So he sought the medical advice where uh, he was described, uh, was diagnosed as hypertension. So routine labs was done. And it had been elevated kidney function. Uh, so he was admitted and started the uh, hemodialysis, and uh, he was diagnosed with this stage renal disease with bilateral small sized kidneys and start noodles. Three years ago, the patient has paresthesia of both upper and lower limb, more in the lower limb of gradual onset progressive force, learning in character. The patient was investigated with the neuro uh, neurology um, physicians. The uh, patient received intermittent course of Melga, short course of 10 mg steroids for six months and with minimal response. Two years ago, the patient had recurrent facial fractures in the for arm with minor trauma, with the recurrent falling due to bone deformity and his leg deformity with generalized bony aches and knee effusion. Uh, resistant elevation of parathyroid hormone uh, uh, begin uh, in spite of maximum dose of um, treatment, Sinacalcet 180 mg, alpha calcidol 2 micrograms three times per week, renal gel TID per day. So, parathyroid scan was done and it revealed left sided parathyroid adenoma was diagnosed. So, the patient referred to parathyroidectomy. But due to the era of 19, uh, COVID 19, the operation was delayed until uh, October, uh, until uh, December 2020. And one gland was inserted subcutaneously in the front of the neck. Uh, but during the admission course, the patient uh, infected with COVID-19 and it took its medication. Uh, there is deterioration of the cardiac function of the patient after this admission. Uh, as the ejection fraction for the patient uh, was 47%, it became 35%. After that, the result of parathyroid hormone is still high. So parathyroid scan was repeated. Unfortunately, the result um, at, at that time was normal. So we repeat it again. Uh, and we, um, we do the follow-up and to exclude malignancy. Uh, as the BTH at that time was 2,000 picogram per milliliter. The parathyroid scan, uh, we repeat it for the second time. It demonstrated ectopic parathyroid gland in the superior with this time. So the patient uh, had the parathyroidectomy for the second time by the cardiothoracic surgeon with improvement of parathyroid hormone and kyphosis. Bone scan was done and severe, uh, during that period, the uh, bone scan was done and it revealed severe osteoporosis. Um, and the denizumab was administrated once in uh, January 2021. The patient has developed severe hypocalcemia in the form of severe twitches and chest pain uh, so uh, uh, we give uh, IV and oral uh, calcium. Uh, one year uh, ago, the patient has difficult walking, climbing stairs, of gradual onset progressive course. Six months ago, the patient has an original dilatation with the testula, uh, and the wound was infected and ruptured. So vermicath insertion was done during that admission. The patient, for the second time, developed COVID-19. After the admission, the uh, cardiac function also declined again, ejection fraction 30%. The past history is Kivis. His family history, his aunt and his grandpa, who is in this stage renal disease. His father, David Kant, hypertension. The examination uh, is, uh, has 
Can tell me the phone when I'm showing it to you. Uh, Bermikas insertions, kyphosis in the, in the back, base caves, atrophy, fill muscles of the lower limb, uh, weakness. Can tell me the phone? Okay. Fee base caves, atrophy, fill muscles, the type of leg, fill, uh, of the leg, uh, neurological manifestation for the patient has um, hypotonia, hyperreflexia, food drop, and the atrophy for muscles for lower limb with high stability gait. Musculoskeletal atrophy of muscles. Here, our problem list was hypertension, congestive heart failure, end stage renal disease, peripheral neuropathy, osteoporosis, tertiary hyperparathyroidism, ectopic parathyroid gland, mild dyspinomegaly, this case. Our differential diagnosis in the beginning of the case was our differential diagnosis. Autoimmune disease, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, vasculitis, and the chalk merit tooth disease. Our investigation. Uh, our investigation, albumin 3.8 and uh, creatinine 11.6, sodium and potassium uh, 1,133, uh, 1, potassium 4.6, uric acid 4.4, hemoglobin 12.6, protein 667. This is a lab for the patient for calcium, phosphorus, PTH. Uh, in the beginning, it was uh, in, uh, calcium 9, phosphorus 6.1. This is in uh, calcet 180 milligram and the uh, renal gel uh, TID with one alpha to microgram three times per week. Um, and after the first operation in the Zumab administration at uh, 2021, uh, the calcium level became 5.3 and phosphorus 2.3. Uh, Will BTH is still high, 2000, in, uh, in spite of the operation. Uh, the, uh, after the operation, in, uh, the BTH level became 117 and 128 will vitamin D level 37 and calcium became 8.6 with phosphorus 1.6. And autoimmune profile negative apart from beta 2 microglobulin 16.4. Ultrasound bilateral atrophic kidney. An echocardiography showed deterioration in the ejection fraction of the patient, which became 30% with grade 2 diastolic function. EMG and nerve conduction show progressive. Uh, increase in the axonal and demyelination to axonal peripheral neuropathy. And X-rays show a clavicle osteolysis. This is a chest X-ray show hypothesis, the vertebral column. X-ray congenital deformity for eye high arched feet. And MR knee uh, show effusion and the medial meniscus tear. The parathyroid scan, parathyroid adenoma. This is the second one, which show ectopic parathyroid adenoma supplementary study. The parathyroid pathology, it's parathyroid adenoma, not malignancy. The big bone uh, shows that um, its score is minus 4.4 to the spine, minus 3 to the arm, and minus 3.7 to the left of the human. Abdominal fat pathology to exclude amyloidosis show no evidence of amyloidosis. So we consult Dr. Ram uh, and uh, he recommended to do bone biopsy for the patient. So Dr. Ram. Thank Dr. Mary Cloyd, do you want to comment on the bone biopsy? Yes. Uh, don't you have a lower magnification? Yes, I do. Okay. Start by 10x or 2.5x? Yeah, yeah, 2.5. Yeah, yeah, the second one. Okay, here you can see that it, it's a piece of uh, cortex incomplete, but and the, the cancerous bone, there is no bone. So he has certainly severe osteoporosis. But what's remarkable here is that the amount of osteoid 
which is stained in red here. The mineralized bone is blue, and the osteoid, that means the bone which is not mineralized yet, it's, uh, it's roughly 100% or 80% of the uh, bone surface, and very wide osteoid seams. Okay, and here in the, this is subcortical, and on the right side, you see you don't have bone, you just have bone marrow. But that in the subcortical bone, you see a lot of osteoid and very irregular uh, trabecules. And if you go to higher magnification, you don't see, go, go higher, maybe? Uh, no, that's... Uh, Do you want a 20x or 10? Yes, please. Yeah, and you, yeah, you can see that uh, we don't see osteoblast covering mm. the osteoid. Usually, the osteoblast make the osteoid, which is the collagen of bone, and after they mineralize it, and here they disappear. So there is no mineralization. And I have to say that it's very severe. And here in the bottom, you can see there is an osteoclast which tried to remove the osteoid but cannot do that. And so it's a very uh, low turnover osteomalacia. And you have remnant, this patient had a severe hyperpara before because you can see some. The, the, the deep osteoid is uh, kind of irregular, and that's what we call woven osteoid. So it's post PTX and also osteoma severe osteomalacia, as you can see here. Yeah. And okay, and here in the blue, this is a solochrome azurine stain for aluminum. And this patient show in light blue, this is aluminum deposition. And here also. And here you don't see it very well, but it's uh, on the right side, the bottom, you can see some. And the aluminum in, in this stain, you can see it at the junction between osteoid and mineralized bone, but also within bone. So because previously he had uh, severe high bone turnover due, due to high PTH, but now with the PTX, done is low turnover and the aluminum is still there. And under fluorescent light microscopy, usually you see tetracycline labeling and here you don't, which is yellow, bright yellow, and here you don't see anything. Do, yeah. And here again, it's, uh, you know, these kind of cases, I saw that a long, long time ago when the Aluminum. How many years ago, Miracle Odd Sensei have seen one of those? Uh, yeah, a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Mm, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, we'll open the case for discussion now. So can you just, uh, in, in 10 seconds, um, carry man, um, summarize your case? Okay, I some also uh, my case and ask uh, two questions for, okay. for our professors. Uh, the first, uh, our case is a male patient, 24 years old, uh, not diabetic, he is hypertensive, congestive heart failure, in the stage renal disease, peripheral neuropathy, base caves, uh, with uh, tertiary hyperparathyroidism and uh, elevated BTH after the parathyroidectomy, patient BTH became low. And with multiple uh, fractures, uh, our uh, my uh, my uh, questions is aluminum is uh, the only criminal in this case, as he uh, 
uh, in this condition as it in, uh, developed ha has any role for peripheral neuropathy and osteoporosis with uh, congestive heart failure or not it has a role in this case or not um, and i'm sorry to one more can we got two slides can you wish something oh hell who will only criminal in the development of peripheral neuropathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, osteoporosis, or not, or just a precipitating factor with uh, another condition like COVID 19. And what's the diagnosis for this case? There are my questions. And what's the treatment we can get? Very good. Case? So, this is evidently a case of uh, high turnover bone disease in the past, secondary to uh, tertiary hyperbara thyroidism with ectopic uh, BTH tissue in the mediastinum, which is not, by the way, uncommon. So my advice, my first advice, when you do a systemic scan as pre-operative uh, assessment, you need to do assessment of the mediastinum. Don't look only to the neck because it's very uh, common to see some parathyroid tissue in the mediastinum. So it's not rare, so you will need to focus on this. Don't look only to the neck look to the chest, to the mediastinum. Because here they did, first they did parathyroidectomy and it was um, unsuccessful surgery. So they repeated the measurement and they saw there is, um, you know, parathyroid tissue in the mediastinum. So they have to reoperate uh, on the mediastinum. So oh, I try to avoid. Now? Not twice, not once. Twice, not right. Twice. Well, first one kept normal. Manhattan report can normal study. Yeah, you, you need to look uh, by yourself that they included the middle and upper part of the chest at least, because sometimes you just do it on the neck if they don't know that this is a frequent finding. This is number one. Number two, this patient, I think we need to focus on dialysis adequacy because this patient has multiple, multiple complications that might be to, uh, related to the dialysis inadequacy. So attaining good kitty over V, and attaining good dialysis adequacy for this patient is uh, also uh, a cornerstone here. Uh, other things, the bullineuropathy that this patient has, sensory motor um, bullineuropathy, uh, it could be several things. I think he had evaluation by the neurologist and rheumatologist, and uh, they agreed that he has hereditary sensory neural uh, bullineuropathy. So that's. Uh, I'm sorry? We consult uh, uh, neurology physicians a lot, and all of them uh, said that it's hereditary. Right, right. So uh, this is another problem. Uh, I don't know if uh, this is related to this condition. By the way, this patient has urinary incontinence long time ago, and it, it seems is. also part of this sensory neural deficit. He has neurogenic bladder. Then he might develop the end stage kidney disease secondary to this, uh, you know, uh, um, long-standing history of uh, autonomic uh, bladder and uh, neurogenic uh, dysfunction and autonomic dysfunction in his bladder might be have frequent UTIs. Um, uh, he has uh, bilinephrites in the past, scarring with FSGS cells. Might be the end-stage kidney disease related to this as well. So we are not expert in this neurological or neuromuscular deficit. He has this hereditary uh, sensory neural deficit. I don't think we are going to um, dig in that. But this patient evidently have um, aluminum staining in his bone biopsy. How to, do, to deal with this? How to prevent this from happening in the future? I'll open uh, the floor to the audience and um, to the um, moderator and the chairperson uh, to ask a question and, and give comments on that. Dr. Ala. Dr. Kariman, thank you very much for this interesting piece. Uh, my, first my first question, uh, what is the duration between the first and the second stability scanning? The scan, the first one can... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it is it a long duration, years or just months? No, 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 just two months, just months, just months, not years. Uh, the first because, one... because I add my voice to uh, Professor Amr, 
uh, I think the uh, ectopic tissue cannot, uh, cannot be, uh, I think it was there, but it, it was missed by the scanning. Right, and, right. Uh, and, and also it was missed by a surgeon. Uh, uh, Dr. Halawa is not here to comment on this, but uh, in many lectures he stressed uh, on the presence of ectopic and sobra memory uh, parathyroid tissue that should be removed during the surgery. So I guess uh, there is uh, uh, an iatrogenic, I mean, uh, the first problem in the surgery itself, because it left the uh, ectopic gland behind and subjected the patient to a, a major surgery, you know? Uh, yeah, so yes. the patient actually is lucky. The exploration of the mediastinum is part of the parathyroidectomy surgery. They have to explore the upper part of the mediastinum looking, even if the system scan is negative, they have to look for ectopic glands. I agree. The second, this patient has any clinical, other clinical evidence of column toxicity. I mean, uh, uh, microcytic anemia, dementia, no, no. any other no, clinical no, 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 manifestations no, no. of The patient is fully conscious. There is no dementia. There is no, uh, his hemoglobin is 12.5, the last one, that month. By the way, he's a very young guy. He's 21 year old. He's in uh, Colette de Gara. Uh, should be very active guy, but with his congenital anomaly that he has this uh, base cavus in his legs, he cannot be uh, very active as he is expecting. Um, very nice guy, nice family. Bolineurothy doesn't actually run uh, clearly in the family. However, there was a concern in his brother and the family are uh, very enthusiastic uh, regarding this uh, patient care and quality of life. So now we know that this patient has aluminum intoxication. Where did, get, where did he get this alum you know, in his bone? Do we have serum level for alum? Do, do we, yeah, do we have this for serum level? Serum alum level. Yes. Serum, alum level. Right, did, did we review the medication serum, history? Level? Has the uh, intake <laughs> of aluminum containing uh, uh, binder. You ask him about also the utensils, the halal that he eats. Is it uh, aluminum? Aluminum. Yeah, he needs to avoid that. If he's taking or was taking any aluminum containing uh, phosphate binder or other medications that contain aluminum, like uh, Dr. Rasha Samir highlighted this, that this medication can have calcium, can have aluminum. So uh, did you review the history? Oral vitamin D? Uh, B, B. B. Oh. I'm not aware it's, of, uh, but it, you can... It is, it is uh, mentioned in the, uh, just revise the alum toxicity in CKD patient uh, chapter in the up-to-date. Many drugs actually are uh, mentioned and attributed to high alum level. Uh, aspirin, uh, colonidine, uh, vitamin B level, erythropoietin. Uh, vitamin it's mentioned B, there, it's up-to-date, but... About the, the content, I, I, I don't have any actual vigor, actually. Dr. Ala, vitamin B as boy, it can induce aluminum intoxication? Aluminum toxicity or not? It is, it is mentioned among the drugs that can cause aluminum toxicity in, uh, in CKD patients. I was surprised, actually, by the, this list of drugs, you know, because yeah. most of them are commonly used in our patients. Right. You can check the vitamin B he received and see if it is uh, associated with aluminum or not, I don't uh, okay. think all kind of uh, vitamin B, they are labeled with aluminum, but you can revive that too. Okay. But again, you need to focus on your RO, you need to focus on your water treatment uh, unit. This is the main source, you know, because the exposure of water with the blood during the dialysis is huge. All other possibilities are there, but the most likely uh, you know, diagnosis is he's getting this during dialysis. And if you want to increase actually his dialysis adequacy, you would increase the exposure to aluminum. So you have, we need to be careful here. Okay, hot. The other thing is we need to do a serum level of aluminum and dysferoxamine test and see how much the, the level is going 
to increase after giving the dysphorexamine dose. هو بس كانت رباب برضه بتدي معانا هي واحده من زمايلنا دكتوره رباب ودكتوره رشاد كانت بتتعلق ان برضه الولد الوحيد اللي ظهر عليه هذه الاعراض باقي الطلبه كويسين يعني باقي المرضى كويسين ما فيهمش اي مشاكل هي الحاله الوحيده اللي بنقلنا اللي فيها التحاليل كانت بالشكل ده. This might be a possibility but I wouldn't be surprised that other patients might have lesser degree of aluminum staining in their bone as well. It takes time. This patient is on dialysis for six years you said. Yeah. Yeah. So six years post barotheridectomy, we just mentioned that barotheridectomy is the highest risk to get aluminum toxicity. The bone is ready to uh, absorb the aluminum by that mm -hmm. time. So we have to be careful, especially if the BTH is low or patient after barotheridectomy can have higher chance of, of getting aluminum toxicity. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Alaikum 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 <تصفيق> في بيبر منشورة يمكن أو قديمة شوية في الـ MDT في 2006 بتتكلم على الألمنم as a hidden source of أو drugs containing ألمنم as a hidden source في العينين السيك دي الحقيقة أنه في one of the tables في البيبر دي حطت الأستيتايل سلسليك أسيد الألبوم من الكالسيوم كربونات It's a very uh, long list of drugs, Ahmed. Very astonishing, you know. كتير جدا يا فندم الكيروس الفوليك اسيد الليزك سلفوروسيمايد الهيبرين الريبويتين الفيتامين بي يا يو ار رايت اي ثينك اتس اتس دوبل بات اولسو وي هاف تو لوك اي ثينك ذا واتر اتسلف ذا درينكينج واتر مايت هاف Much more aluminum in Egypt. You can just, you know, visit the water treatment units. You know, the uh, locally or nationally, you see how much uh, aluminum carbonate and the phosphate they add. It's a huge oh, yes, force. Yes. yes, I agree with you completely, sir. Yes. Yeah. And also, يعني الناس اللي بيكحتوا الخلل اليوتنس الزيدول الألومنيوم. When uh, you scrap them, you can get aluminum from with the food also. Again. <laughs> Again, the water <laughs> <treatment> <laughs> mean, mean <laughs> Right. But we have to be careful of all other kinds of unusual sources as well. This has been reported several times. Two cases It's... of alum toxicity. I mean, I'm going to score in order to all the people in Kentucky. حالتين هم ما شافوهمش من القرون. Yeah. So uh, I think this is alarming. This is the second case we are presented. So in 2021, we did two bone biopsies in Egypt. Both of them were stained positively with the aluminum. The first had 80% uh, staining of alum, and the second has 30 to 40% staining of aluminum. So we have to be careful. The other problem, this for Roxamine, it seems it's not very available in Egypt. And the first case we tried to, Dr. Nihal and the team, Mansura team, tried to get it and it was very hard to get it. So hopefully um, Dr. Kariman can find this for Roxamine to do the test and then to treat the patient with it. It's not that safe drug and it's not indicated in all patients who have alum toxicity. I mean, it might increase the alum toxicity as well, you know? And it might, you know, it might increase case. acute, right, because it increases the blood level, so it might go yeah. to the blood. So it, yeah. it you know, it chelate and move the aluminum from the bone and from the tissue, but when the level goes very high, especially, actually it's contraindicated if the level is high, because it, it increases yeah. acute toxicity. But if the level is low, you can just test and to mobilize carefully, then you, you try to remove this uh, uh, alum lately. I agree with you completely. And the side thing, effect, you know, of uh, increasing the mycormycosis like in the fungal in the, uh, infection, we don't commonly see it, but uh, right. you know, I think it's, Dr. It's a very Sofra, one of the first lessons we learned from him is the administration of this ferroxamine can increase the risk of mycormycosis, right? Okay. I think we have a case 1994 or 95. Yeah, yeah. It was a transplant, I think. Transplantation. Yeah. Right. Female patient. 
أول سؤال إحنا دلوقتي عملنا محطة المية كلها طول الفترة دي. Can you please speak English and try to be closer to the microphone? The result for our unit water treatment unit is negative for aluminium. It's negative everywhere. It's only for you. I'm going to take samples when I come back, or maybe next month there is somebody coming to us. He can bring uh, uh, some samples, you know, serum sample and water uh, uh, treatment samples, so we can recheck that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amber, uh, if, if you allowed me to share my opinion on this uh, issue of aluminum. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Um, uh, if the problem is the uh, water treatment in the dialysis unit, the story will be different. Um, first, the symptomatology, it will present with encephalopathy, seizures, Again, this more, is a chronic accumulation, Mahmoud. This is not an acute accumulation. Yes, you know uh, I agree. The uh, um, uh, hemodialysis induced uh, uh, the water in uh, what the hemodialysis induced aluminum intoxication due to the water uh, treatment in a false method. Uh, it mostly will cause acute, not chronic, as in our patients. No, no, suboptimal. You know, there is a lower level of aluminum. It's not very high, but chronic exposure. But, uh, you know, with our patient serum will absorb little by little over time, then this will go to the tissue and stain it and uh, suppress the bone formation without inducing this acute encephalopathy. But if you have, you know, very high exposure, yes, you get the acute encephalopathy right away. So this yeah. patient, you remember, we reviewed the Brazilian studies, we reviewed the Mexican studies, Saudi Arabia studies, this is frequent finding in asymptomatic patient. They stain okay. the bone, the, the aluminum goes to the bone, stay there without inducing. It can induce chronic encephalopathy. So the patient takes years to have, you know, uh, central or neurological symptoms, but it doesn't cause acute psychosis or encephalopathy right away. Why it right. doesn't affect the RBCs count and hemoglobin? Why it doesn't cause any? Yeah, not not all cases. It depends on if it uh, deposits in the bone marrow or not. I I don't know. Maybe Mary can can comment on that. But to suppress uh, or to make uh, you know abogen resistance, it has to stay in the bone marrow, not only in the bone. Right, Mary Claude. You will not, fi not find the fully blown picture of uh, alum toxicity. As I'm saying, it's a chronic accumulation. So you are not expecting to find the, the full clinical picture, I mean, dementia, anemia. Uh, I'm sure this case is, has, has some sort of alum toxicity, but we all agree for this, but we couldn't know where is the source. Is it the water treatment unit failure or from excessive drug? By the way, Nihal, I think she revised the alum content of vitamin B and she wrote here that the vitamin, the vitamin B complex contains 33.6 milligram per gram alum and the calcium carbonate as well contain alum, but I couldn't read the. Uh, uh, 317 milligram, Dr. Ale. I see. So Larger amount. Yeah, calcium carbonate and vitamin 317. B. 317. Uh, 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 it, it was in the drugs uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, people. Uh, uh, um, in USA and uh, all over the world are receiving these drugs. So it, if the cause is drugs, so it is expected to see it in uh, uh, universally in all bone biopsies. Both, Mahmoud. It might be both, you know, it might be some, some, some elements of drug and some elements of water treatment unit uh, failure, I mean. Yes. Very good, very good. I think we need uh, to uh, stop by here uh, regarding discussing this case. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we need to open the panel for further questions. And uh, then we are going to uh, uh, discuss the take home message from the meeting. And we'll talk about the evaluation form. Then we'll announce the next meeting and we'll close within 15 minutes. Um, so, Mamdouh, do you have any question in the chat box? Yes, I think there are like so many questions in the chat. Go ahead, please. Okay. So, do you want to start with a question as regards the case? Whatever so, you like. Okay. So, Dr. Ahmed Abdurab asked if 
neuropathy be a symptom of aluminum toxicity? I think his neuropathy was like a very old presentation, even before he started dialysis, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, he has hereditary sensory uh, yeah. uh, motor deficit that is unlikely to be related to his kidney disease, I think, or at least to his aluminum toxicity. He has biscavus, you know, congenital anomalies. Uh, so it's, it's uh, very hard to be related even to his renal osteodystrophy. Okay. We have a question about, by this way, you are giving us some messages to screen for aluminum level in all CKD patients, especially with list of drugs containing? Right. We actually do, even in America. We haven't seen, as Dr. Mary Claude said, we, she hasn't seen a case in America for 35 years, but we still do an annual uh, assessment of the serum uh, aluminum level, and of course, uh, with monthly assessment of the water treatment levels. So you need to do that. I would recommend actually not an annual, but might be every six months or so. But the thing is you need to do it in a reliable uh, lab. This is the main thing. Okay, and we have a question from Dr. Karim. Dr. Karim Nagati said, uh, as regards the point Dr. Amr said about <laughs> calcium balance difference in CKD patient. We have 50 year old patient CKD since four years and presented recently with end-stage kidney disease. He was diagnosed with hypoparathyroidism 20 years ago. He is admitted to hospital after routine follow-up showed calcium 3.5 milligram per deciliter, phosphorus of eight and BTH of five. He is asymptomatic, the scan is normal. He was on calcium and active vitamin D before admission. How to manage and to which targets? I, I would, Unmute Dr. Karim if he had more further explanation about it. So could it be an autoimmune hypoparathyroidism? What is the cause of, is it iatrogenic or is it congenital? Um, we actually refer these cases to be seen by endocrinologists uh, to make sure that this is not a multiple endocrine um, you know, dysplasias or syndromes. Uh, so did, did this patient have any work up, uh, you know, for this hypopara? Actually, you know, Dr. Amri, we don't know that the cause of hypoparathyroidism. Uh, he is under follow-up with an endocrinologist. He is under follow-up with endocrinologist. <coughs> the cause is uh, not known. Okay. The other question is when he developed the end-stage kidney disease, his BTH didn't go up at all. No, the, beat, the last BTH now is five. He is CKD for five for four years, and now he is in the stage of disease. Here. But they didn't start hemodialysis yet. Okay, and he's still very hypocalcemic. Yes, 3.5. How was he treated for hypobara for this 20 years? Just calcium and vitamin D. Okay, now there is 184 BTH he can receive. And I was actually was talking to one of our endocrinologists about that. This is not the teribaratide we, we give as osteoanabolic. This is 184, the whole BTH molecule that they can give uh, as relatively replacement therapy for the hypobara. I don't have a particular or personal experience with that, but endocrinologists, they do because they see this patient with autoimmune or congenital hypobarathyroidism and uh, uh, our endocrinologists, they bought this patient on at least a year or two and see how it goes. The good thing now, even if he has any remnant hypobarothyroid tissue with this end stage kidney disease, it can get hyperplastic and the BTH might go up a little bit. So we'll see what happens, but I will defer this to the endocrinologist to give him 184 BTH. I think, uh, I don't know, is it available in Egypt? I know it's available. I have no US, idea. I, under I, the I, name I, of Netbara. Right. Had, uh, BTH 184, but I don't know if it is available in Egypt. The endocrinologist would know better than us because this is not related to our uh, renal disease. This is just a primary endocrinopathy that they usually treat. Thank you, Karim, for your question. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, yes, we sir. have another question. If we, uh, so we have a question, what is the relation between iron level and CKD, MBD? 
Very good question. Actually, this Bishop, the last uh, Bishop, we forgot to mention also, he was stained uh, uh, lightly with, uh, with the iron. Uh, so he might have, I, and I asked Kariman about that, multiple blood transfusion, or he received a lot of iron in the past. And this iron also can suppress the bone formation and can induce osteomalacia. So in severe cases of uh, hemochromatosis or iron overload, it can also precipitate and be stained in the, in the bone and induce a similar picture to the alum toxicity locally in the bone with suppression of bone formation and inducing osteomalacia. Yeah, make sure that his ferritin is not over a thousand and he's not getting a lot of IV iron. No, 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 no. His uh, transcreen saturation, I will, I will just. And this ferroxamine, of course, will help with both iron overload and alum overload. Very good. Any other question, Mamdou? We have another question from Professor Khaled. If we are facing osteoporosis in hemodialysis patient, if we not have bone biopsy and BTH and bone specific alkaline phosphatase are not conclusive, we should away from bisphosphonate. Is this right? This is his question. That's a good, very good question. And I think Mamdou, you mentioned this in, uh, in the study that we uh, wrote an editorial comment um, about using bisphosphonates to patients who don't uh, uh, have uh, actual diagnosis about their osteoporosis at high or low. Uh, my question is you need to do just simply uh, instead of only BTH and total alkaline phosphatase, you can do bone specific alkaline phosphatase. If it is less than 20, don't, don't give uh, uh, any uh, anti-resorptive therapies. So don't give bisosunids, don't give denozumab or serum or others, uh, because the chances of having low, or low or adynamic bone disease will be high. If the uh, bone specific alkaline phosphatase is over 20 and the BTH, the IBTH is over 200, the chances of having uh, low or adynamic bone disease is low. So you can give bisosunates, but you need to follow up the, uh, this biomarker every, maybe ideally every three to four months, maybe every six months if you cannot do it uh, you know, regularly. So both patients on bisosunates, a smaller dose, so maybe 35 instead of 70 every week of Fosamax, or five instead of 10 milligram daily of Fosamax. Then every three to four months or maybe six months, you can do bonus specific alkaline phosphatase. You can do TRAP 5B. Then, if the bonus specific alkaline phosphatase is not very low, if the TRAP 5B is not very low, you can keep uh, giving the vicious units or anti resorptive therapy for a year or two. Then, repeat the DEXA scan and see if there is any improvement or at least there is a slower rate of uh, decline of the BMP. Yeah, and the ferritin? El ferritin, no. Uh, that That's fine. Just make sure that it's not over a thousand. Okay, keep going. Do we have any? We yeah. have uh, a time just for one question, then we uh, try to conclude our meeting so and to the, give an announcement. Okay, so I will. So the trend for BTMs is, is more important than the single first measurement. Exactly. So, Even not only before treatment, but on treatment to see the, to monitor the response and offset treatment after you stop treatment. It's very important, especially with denozumab, there is a rebound increase in bone resorption marker after you stop denozumab. So there is a good idea actually to alternate denozumab with uh, osteoanabolic like uh, the 134 BTH because the bone resorption in, in increases after giving the, uh, after stopping the denozumab. So we have three more questions. The first one is, is any bisphosphonates preferred over others regarding safety and efficacy? Is, I will let you, Mamdou, to answer this question. Uh, I don't think we have data as regarding the prefer if, if any of them is better than others as regard uh, safety, as regard efficacy, the third generation bisphosphonate is 
is presumed to be more effective than the second and the first generation. More, more potent. Yeah, or, or more potent, but they, they talk also about the efficacy. Uh, but I don't think that we have data as regard uh, the safety comparing uh, one bisphosphonate to another. The first generation bisphosphonate, we have some studies that they retard the progression of vascular calcification, but I don't think that they are widely used now like the etidronate. Yeah, but there is reports also they can induce osteomalacia. Remember that. Yes. <laughs> so okay, so etidronate yeah. first generation can induce osteomalacia. This doesn't happen in the third generation. So we like to use the third generation. As Mamdouk said, first generation might inhibit cardiovascular calcification better, but of course, with the risk of uh, osteomalacia and uh, over suppression of uh, the bone, uh, you know, uh, activities and bone formation, bone turnover, and uh, and also because uh, the uh, the third generation might be uh, more potent and effective, so we like to use the third generation. So and second. the the good thing in in bisphosphonates, you have several forms, and you have short acting daily forms every week, every month, every six months, every year. So you have several oral and inject injectable forms, so you can just choose whatever. But you try to use third generation. Don't use the old, uh, you know, etidronate or, or first generation. Uh, second question about calcium dose, we adjust the dose according to elemental dose of drug to reach 20, uh, two, two gram of calcium per day? Two gram is too much for, C for advanced CKD patients. Yeah. There is a study, uh, you know, a calcium balance study and showed that B CKD patients can tolerate a mild increase in calcium intake. But if you compare 800 milligram to, to 2,000 milligram, as you mentioned, the two gram, they cannot handle the 2,000 milligram. They will be on very positive calcium balance. In normal situation, if you put a patient on high calcium intake, he will excrete more calcium in the urine. So the calcium balance will be okay. But in CKD patients, they cannot tolerate that. They cannot handle <laughs> the excess amount of calcium. Then you will be in a positive calcium balance with increased chance of calcification. So uh, we don't recommend more, more than maybe 1,200, 1,300. It, it depends on the age race. And, uh, 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 you know, if the patient is lean or obese, so it's several factors. But in general, not more than for the patient, 1,200, 1,300, something like that. Uh, there is a third question. Give us steps to avoid a dynamic bone disease in hemodialysis patient and on patient post parasurgery. Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I think uh, to avoid uh, the low turnover bone disease, which is the most frequent uh, renal osteodystrophy abnormality in our patient, is first of all try to minimize the calcium. That's the same, same, you know, back to the square one. So the alizate calcium should be not more than three milli equivalent per deciliter, okay? Uh, in BD patient, because they are on 3.5, uh, they might have higher, you know, higher chance of uh, low turnover bone disease. So I would recommend 2.5, even if the patient, uh, I think if, you know, if the patient is on high, calcium balance or has low turnover bone disease, I can put the patient on 2.25 instead of 2.5. Still, the KD go recommendation is 2.5 to 3. But I think 3 is too much. Maybe in the future, we'll have another update and they lower down this target. So minimizing the calcium is the key to uh, you know, avoid and prevent or at least slow down the progression of a dynamic bone disease cutting down on vitamin D analogs, cutting down on or stopping the calcium mimetics. By the way, the effect of calcium mimetic to induce a dynamic bone disease is less compared to vitamin D analogs because sinacalcet still can stimulate the bone formation. So if you lower down, say, the BTH from 500 to 200, using one patient, you, you lower down the BTH with vitamin D analogs, the other patient, you lower it down with calcium mimetics, the chances of having low uh, turnover bone disease will be much higher if you lower it down with vitamin A compared to the sinacalcet or the calcium mimetics. So calcium mimetics is not as bad as vitamin D analogs and other vitamin D. So 
uh, uh, you know, avoid aluminum intoxication because it induces low turnover osteomalacia. Avoid iron overload. These are all important. If you do, if you need to do a barotheridectomy, you need to be gentle. Don't leave the patient with BTH of, uh, of 10 or 20. You need to talk to your surgeon and uh, avoid extensive surgeries and try to have a gentle barotheridectomy and keep the BTH within a target of 150 to 300 or so. Okay, I think uh, uh, we are going to... Uh, yeah. We have uh, the feedback link from Dr. Mahmoud Subh. Right, I will stop sharing, then Mahmoud can share his screen. So there is an evaluation. We need to learn from you how to improve our performance for next meetings. We are, as we said, we are planning to have uh, one of the CME of these CME meetings every two months. Uh, so there will be a form, Mahmoud Sabha is going to distribute these forms, then you need to fill it in to get the certificates. And I will let Mahmoud to show you how to fill it in. Uh, it's simple, we just uh, give uh, the name and email um, uh, and uh, general evaluation for uh, the course and how uh, could this course affect your practice in the field of CKD MBD. What was uh, what were the good points in this course, and how can we improve our lectures for the future? And what do you think about the duration of the course? Was it short, long, or suitable? And um, on scale of one to five, how can you evaluate uh, each lecture uh, was given in the course? Um, not very long. Uh, and if you have any additional comment regarding the lectures. And which topics would you prefer to hear or from us to discuss in the next meetings, inshallah? Very good, very good. So uh, next thing, and we have our next meeting, inshallah, in two months, it will be 31st of March and April 1st. So it will be Thursday and, uh, and Friday again from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And uh, uh, we will continue, inshallah, of having the same courses every two months. Dr. Nihal, do you have any comments or do you want to say anything about, I know that you did extensive review for aluminum toxicity. Uh, do you have any advices or take home messages for us about aluminum toxicity? If not, I'm going to share my screen again, and we are going in the next two minutes before we conclude. We are going to. Uh, I think Dr. <laughs> Dr. Nihal uh, wants to share something. I will unmute Dr. Nihal. Okay, you are unmuted now if you want. Dr. Amr Maish, Ahmed can I mute? Okay. I, um, I you can want to share, share something uh, in, in, in a yes, minute okay. or two? In, in one minute. We can share us. Uh, mm -hmm. One minute, please. Screen. Yes. So um, we can uh, take a home message from our uh, cases, two cases of uh, uh, aluminum toxicity. Um, at first, we showed the screen for aluminum toxicity with plasma aluminum concentration at least yearly or quarterly in those receiving aluminum containing drugs. And the rise in the serum aluminum level of more than 50 microgram per liter following the dysphoroxamine test, not the simple uh, serum aluminum level. Uh, dysphoroxamine test, uh, uh, we can do it by giving the patient uh, 5 milligram per kilogram a dose of dysphoroxamine uh, one hour before the end of the hemodialysis session, and then wait for the next uh, hemodialysis session. Before the next hemodialysis session, we will take the, the aluminum sample. So we will take two aluminum sample, uh, one before the uh, infusion of dysphoroxamine, and the next in the uh, uh, before dialysis after two days, uh, 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 and see the difference between both. 
So if it increased to be more than 50 microgram per deciliter, so uh, this patient uh, was suspicion to be uh, alumnum toxicity, especially if the patient have a parathyroid hormone less than uh, 150. Uh, so we can predict the alumnum intoxication in this patient. The gold standard for the diagnosis in biopsy with, uh, is biopsy, is bone biopsy, and staining should be more than 25% of the bone surface. Uh, so if I have a symptomatic patient with an aluminum concentration between 20 to 200 without bone biopsy, so uh, uh, we should give the patient treatment with this for examine uh, by five milligram per kilogram of this feral per week. So it's a single dose per week for eight weeks. And after eight infusions, after the end of the eight weeks, we do the dysphorexamine uh, test again. And if the dysphorexamine test is still positive, more than 50 uh, microgram per liter, we uh, repeat the cycle again for eight weeks and uh, uh, repeat the dysphorexamine test after ended the new eight weeks uh, and continue the dysphoral uh, cycles until the blood aluminum level decreased to less than 50 microgram per liter. Someone asking me about how to give this feral in this patient, I will give it a, a, a one hour uh, infusion, five hours before the hemodia filtration session. So every week, I will give the patient five milligram per kilogram uh, infusion over one hour, five hour before starting the dialysis session. And uh, from the serious complication of this feral is mycormycosis and tuberculosis. So we should keep eye on those patients who are taking this feral until they can, uh, stop their treatment. And lastly, uh, this is the table uh, containing some uh, drugs which is very common drug in the dialysis patient, uh, and all of them containing alumnum amount. As we see, the most important is B-complex, which I, I think most of our patients taking B-complex and uh, acetyl salicylic acid, uh, and calcium carbonate containing a very high amount, which is 317 microgram per gram of the drugs. Uh, also, the erythropoietin, which is containing a small amount, and heparin, which is given every uh, dialysis session. So, uh, most of these drugs we given to the uh, our patient in our dialysis unit may contribute in the aluminum toxicity. Maybe not the the uh, the cause of aluminum toxicity, but may contribute with other environmental toxicity or uh, tap water intake uh, in the aluminum uh, intoxication in our patient. And thank you. Thank you so much, and how that uh, was very uh, helpful. Um, we are going. Can you stop sharing, uh, yes. Nihal? <clears throat> okay, we are going to summarize in two minutes and conclude our meetings. So I started the meeting with a lecture about bone quality and bone quantity. So both are very important. Don't only focus on uh, quantity, but also focus on quality. There is measures to uh, assess the bone quality especially use the trabecular bonus you know, score that you can get from the DEXA scan. If you don't get it, ask your radiologist to add this uh, software. You can do the bone turnover biomarker to tell you about uh, the bone turnover, if it is low or high, and how to treat your patient, and what is the mechanism of uh, bone loss. You can do other high-resolution technique, then uh, the gold standard is to do bone biopsy. It will be very available at least in Egypt, hopefully by the end of this year or early next year. If you are interested in the bone quality concept, you can go and read our two articles, part one for diagnosis, uh, the bone quality problem, and part two to manage and improve bone quality in our CKD patients. Then I will let uh, Dr. Iman to highlight and to mention her take home message from her lecture. Please go ahead, Iman. You are unmuted now, if you want. Um, uh, can you take the home message? Uh, testing for CKD MVD should be started with CKD grade three, and frequency of testing is increased by CKD progression. Uh, therapeutic decision should be dependent on serial rather than single measurements of biochemical parameters. Uh, DEXA BMD can predict fracture risk in CKD patient. So if a low BMD will lead to additional therapeutic intervention, BMD should be assessed in these patients. 
the lack of ability to perform a bone biopsy may not justify withholding anti-resorbative therapy to patients at high risk of fracture. <clears throat> Treatment should aim at uh, over hyperphosphatemia in patients with all stages of CKD and include phosphate lowering agent. Uh, calcium binder should be generally restricted on those patients. Uh, positive calcium balance should be avoided in adults uh, with CKD as long as asymptomatic mild hypocalcemia is tolerated. Treatment of hyperparathyroidism should be started if it is persistent or progressively increasing. In peridial CKD patient, vitamin D analogs uh, should be restricted. Uh, calcium mimetic calcitriol or vitamin D analogs are all acceptable first, first uh, line options in patients with grade 5 dialysis on dialysis. Uh, <clears throat> this practice guideline should be used in combination with clinical judgment due to lack of an equivocally actionable recommendations. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you, Iman. Then uh, the uh, uh, next uh, presentation was done by Dr. Mahmoud Saf, and he, uh, we discussed the hypoparathyroidism and uh, severe hypocalcemia that can happen after parathyroidectomy. And the take home message was to start early to control the CKD and BD. Otherwise, if you leave the patient with severe secondary or tertiary hyperbara, he or she will need baratheridectomy. If this happens, we have to talk to the surgeon to be gentle and don't overcorrect the hypocalcemia after the baratheridectomy. Try to um, just correct the calcium to the lowest level that can be tolerable without serious side effects. And you can try osteobuilders. We discussed the BTH the, you know, the BTHRB and the romosozumab, which is anti and antibody, all are valid option to improve the bone formation rate for this patient. Barathyroid transplantation is an option. It has been done just in a small series of patients, but it's still valid option. If you are preparing the patient for transplantation, you expect that this hypocalcemia might be magnified, might be severe. So you need to have a strategy to avoid uh, both transplantation hypocalcemia. Then I will let uh, Dr. Ahmed Abdel Wahab to give his home, uh, you know, uh, messages just in a minute, if you want, uh, Dr. Ahmed, to give us your take home messages. Thanks, Dr. Ham. Um, uh, in fact, my take-home messages from the uh, from the lecture um, would be at first follow up uh, your patient uh, when you first meet him. Early referral to a nephrologist is very important. And once you meet your patient with CKD, be sure that he has some uh, degree of uh, CKD and BD. Start uh, surveillance, start uh, control of, uh, of phosphate, PTH, and calcium. And like Dr. Amr said, avoid or restrict using the calcium containing phosphate binders. Uh, remember that the um, follow up of PTH and calcium and phosphorus is a dynamic process. Do not depend on a single reading of PTH or calcium or phosphorus. Always uh, uh, get uh, a timeline for your patient to follow uh, uh, him up. Again, try to control the diet of your patient advise your patient on dialysis to uh, stick to have three uh, sessions per week or more if he can afford, four, uh, four hours each session uh, for adequate control of, of phosphate. Uh, uh, advise him to eat and um, I think we should uh, in Egypt go for the concept of a dietitian or a nutritionist in, in, in our units. Uh, to help us uh, improve the service for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Then we have two cases presented today that showed some aluminum intoxication. You remember this picture, don't you know? forget this picture, the aluminum is staining in the bone that can suppress the bone formation and induce osteomalacia and bone loss. It's very important, try to rule it out. For decades, we thought this problem has been done, but it seems it's still a problem and it should be in our differential diagnosis. Then uh, the last speaker today was, uh, the last lecture uh, was uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Mamdou. I will let him to summarize the take home message before we conclude. So I would say about osteoporosis in CKD patient that we should 
early screen those patients with DEXA scan, consider lower threshold for T scores, utilize more of trabecular bonus score and the vertebral fracture assessment. There is no added cost, and we can do that with a regular DEXA machine. Do the bone turnover marker, consider the bone biopsy if we are not sure about the turnover status of our patient. And um, like strengths more on non-pharmacological intervention, advise patient about diet and advise patient about exercise. They are very important. And control CKD, MBD. Then if we are using, if, we, uh, if you are going to use uh, uh, bone specific therapy, a precision medicine based approach is better. Use anti-resorbative in patient with high turnover bone disease and use osteoanabolics in patient with low turnover, osteo, uh, with low turnover bone disease and usually monitor your treatment with BTMs and the DEXA scans. Thank you. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. I think we are uh, concluded our meeting and uh, uh, we need to stop by here. Sorry, we have uh, about uh, 25 minutes delay today. Again, stick around we need uh, to see you again two months from now 31st of march and uh, uh, first of april please mark your agenda make yourself available we are here for you we are going to discuss uh, gn the basics and updates and bromonephritis uh, treatment and management so please stay with us please fill the evaluation forms to help us to improve our performance next time then you will receive your certificate. Dr. Uh, uh, Mahmoud Sof is going to send everyone the link for this uh, Zoom meeting. We are going to uh, put it in uh, the uh, YouTube uh, as videos. Uh, we already have yesterday's uh, presentation. Uh, Mamdouh, Hamad Mamdouh already uh, posted this in YouTube. And uh, maybe in an hour or two, we'll have Today's lecture posted in YouTube. The link will be sent to you. So please feel free to listen to the lecture again. If you want to do even before your evaluation, if you missed any part, you can go ahead and uh, watch the videos before evaluating our lectures. Um, so I think uh, this will conclude our session today and our course for yesterday and today. And I will let Dr. Uh, Ala and uh, Dr. Ghada or Dr. Nagy to conclude and give any comments, uh, please go ahead. Is Dr. Nagy around? Yes, I'm here. You, do you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Hear you do. Right. Yes, Dr. Okay, I, I think this is one of the, of the most successful uh, uh, on, online meetings that I have attended recently. And uh, uh, thanks for you. I'm, uh, 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 the, the, there was a lot of attendees in the, in the meeting, and uh, I think it, the meeting is, uh, is very helpful to us, and it will uh, um, stimulate good practice in, in nephrology, especially in the, in the bone aspect of, uh, of renal disease and dialysis. And uh, I, I hope we, we, we will stick to the recommendations that we, we heard today about reducing calcium intake and reducing um, one alpha intake because this is um, a usual practice for, for from all the nephrologists in Egypt. They start uh, vitamin D, uh, one alpha and calcium very early in the course of uh, renal disease and they keep on without even monitoring serum calcium or phosphorus level. Uh, I hope inshallah and uh, we have uh, uh, in the future uh, meeting as successful as that or even more successful and I hope that we will enjoy everything you introduced to us Amf, and thank you very much thank you Dr. Nagy thank you so much uh, Dr. Allah. I would like to I would like to thank all of you the attendee actually and the speakers uh, and actually we will miss you for this uh, couple of months uh, I just joined my recommendation to uh, have said by uh, Professor Amr, Professor Nagy, and my colleagues. Thank you very much, and we'll meet again in a couple of months, inshallah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you again in, in, in two months. And uh, please uh, uh, respond to Mahmoud and to Mamdouh. 
about the evaluation and you'll get the certificate and uh, watch the videos and we'll see you in the GN course in two months. Thank you so much.